evening. Welcome to DGNR. It is June 6th and it is 6.33. All right, I'll entertain a motion. Is your mic on, Patty? Well, no, it's not. <laughs> Motion to take up item one. Second. Thank you. Um, and before I start that, just want to acknowledge that um, the DGRR committee is made up of myself, the chair. We have uh, Councillor Sullivan, Councillor Devine, Councillor Anderson Burgos, and Councillor Ocasio. So item one is a public hearing for a special permit application for a home occupation at 42 Aaron Arno Arnodale Ave for driveway seal coating business. Um, so that was continued from um, April 22nd. I don't see additional information here. Um, and I don't see Mr. Bradford, either? Madam Chair, oh. we, did, we, did deliver, uh, we did receive communications from the landlord for okay. the tenant. It's a few pages long, so it can yeah. Something stapled. Yes. Madam Chair? Yes, Jeffrey. Just a quick note, just a technical note, just so you don't forget, you still have to make a motion to open the public hearing. Yeah, okay. motion to open a public hearing. Second. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, do I need to read the entire letter into the public record, Jeffrey? Since it is a public hearing, uh, I yeah. believe you do. All right. So I would like to start by reading um, the letter from Dylan Bradford, who's the owner of 42 Arnodale Ave. This may take a moment, so bear with me. <laughs> To whom it may concern, I'm, I'm the owner, landlord of 42 Arnodale Bless Avenue Bless you. <laughs> um, in Holyoke and have been renting to Florin Muradian since 2018 via Pittman, Whitman Properties. Over this time, he's been an excellent tenant, never missed a rent payment, even including, even including during COVID pandemic when I offered flexibility given the quarantine and uncertain financial situations. When Mr. Moradian approached me about obtaining this permit so that he could start his own business of seal coating, my first concern was the safety of everyone in the house and general property environment. After further discussion with him, I was confident that Mr. Moradian knew what he was doing, had properly planned, and was not in over his head. Therefore, I had no issue with signing a document giving him permission to pursue the home occupancy permit with the added proviso that he was legally and monetarily responsible for any issues that came as a result of the equipment or products that are kept on the property. After the initial DGNR meeting on 422, Florin contacted me about the neighbors having some issues with the permit grant being granted. So once it was posted, I watched the proceedings and noted that the items of concern from the neighbors and council members. After doing a significant amount of research into these race issues, some are proper to be apprehensive about, while others are overblown. I contacted each of the neighbors that presented at the 422 meeting so that they could discuss and determine a path forward that would work for all parties. I met with Mrs. Natz, who reiterated her concerns about possible smells reaching her home located 100 yards down the road. Due to her medical sensitivity and general environmental problems, if a spill of the seal coating material were to occur. When I contacted Ms. Reardon via texting the number I still had saved from when I was a resident at 42 Arnadale, she refused to communicate through that medium, stating that her preference for email communication. I sent her an email to give her um, I, s I sent her an email to her given address inquiring about scheduling a meeting with myself and Mr. Meridian, to which she replied with refusal stating, I am unable to meet with you and your tenant and can respond in writing. This email coupled with other complaints and actions that she has taken vis-a-vis -vis minor property issues with Mr. Meridian led me to pursue addressing her concerns in an alternative matter. Additionally, Mr. Meridian and I slightly modified our initial agreement so that he is responsible for the added tax bill associated with the commercial zoning of a, a portion of the property. In collaboration with Mr. Meridian below, I will address each of the items raised 
at the 422 meeting as well as how the requirements for the HO permit will be met. I feel that it's important for members of the Holyoke community to be able to pursue their small business interests <clears throat> excuse me, and that support at the beginning of these endeavors is vital to their success and prosperity. Chemicals and toxicity. After researching the types of seal coating, Mr. Meridian has consented to altering the specific product that he uses as a seal coat from a coal tar based product to one that is asphalt emulsion. Comparatively, asphalt emulsion contains more natural products, have no carcinogenic effects or flammable ingredients, and are only slightly more expensive than the original coal, tarts, coal tar seal coat, which is essentially unchanged since its proliferation in the mid-1900s. Asphalt emulsions also contain a hundred, oh, sorry, a thousand times less uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, also known as PAH, PAHs, the main environmental contaminant of concern from coal tar seal coat, according to the USGS report from 2016. A full safety data sheet uh, of an asphalt emulsion product from Seal Master, the company that Mr. Meridian acquires a seal coat from, with highlighted important features is attached. Um, I don't think you can see this, but um, they have composition, composition information on ingredients in a, in a short table for limestone, asphalt, kaolin, and bent bentonite. Above is the ingredient list from the aforementioned Seal Master product, which is then mixed with water and sand and heated to an applicable temperature prior to Mr. Meridian receiving the product at the Seal Master location in Worcester. Kaolin is known as China clay and is naturally occurred clay mi mineral that allows other ingredients to cohere and provide shine. Bentonite is a clay rock that provides a sealing component due to its crystalline structure swelling when it absorbs water, which creates a low permeability barrier. None of these are ingredients are labeled as hazardous, toxic, or as pollutant in regards to the Clean Water Act. It's important to mention that Mr. Meridian will not be storing substantial amounts of seal coat on the premises. Uh, when he is booked for a job, he acquires the amount necessary from Seal Master go straight to the job site and applies the seal coat. Any longer term storage requires significantly more infrastructure than is easily available to a one person operation. If there is a drastic overestimation, the excess can either be dried out and recycled or brought back to seal master under certain circumstances. While there is likely to be some dried material on the inside of the storage tank, this amount is significant and is cleaned out at the end of a seal coating season. Any accidental spillage can simply be simply be dammed and physically removed with the area cleaned with household soap and water. Cleaning and disposal. Due to the simple nature of the equipment involved, cleaning it with household soap and water is all that is required. The water use can simply be stored in a bucket and allowed to evaporate, leaving small amounts of the dried seal coat material behind. A larger cleaning of the entire tank at the end of the season may include physically removing dried material from the inside. The dried asphalt can be recycled at approved locations in Massachusetts, then the closest being Palmer Paving Corporation in East Hampton. Odors and noise. The possible odors and noise associated with seal coating and its equipment are the heated asphalt material in the tank and the emissions from the motor that runs the pump. As discussed above, there should be little to no seal coat stored in the tank, as this is simply wasted material that Mr. Meridian has already paid for and would need to pay to dispose of. Additionally, the tank needs to be kept close to, pre to prevent any infiltration that may contaminate the future product. So these aspects should drastically limit any exposure of seal coat to the air around the tank and therefore neighboring households. The motor that runs the pump is a 200 cc equal to a gas powered self propelled uh, hand lawn mower. So this would have roughly equivalent would have roughly equivalent noise vapor emissions when in use. However, given that no spraying of the seal coating will occur on the premises, this motor would only be used in order to flush the clean flush clean the sprayer, a process that does not take much time. Physical safety. Whew. 
As previously mentioned, the tank should be kept close and latched whenever not in use or being cleaned. The tank is sealed via a latching drum lid with a vapor gasket to prevent oxidation of the material during transport. This latch is significantly weighted in order to provide a proper seal to a 55 gallon drum sized lid. When I examined the tank with Mr. Murady and I needed to plant my feet and exert a significant, uh, significant amount of force to pop the latch in order to open the tank. Oh, thank you, Jeffrey. Oh. <laughs> Additionally, this is a bar that lays across the full width of the opening once the lid is off. These physical barriers prevent any access to the interior of the tank by anyone who is not an adult-sized person, as well as stopping any accidental falling in if the tank lid happens to be open. When the tank is being stored, a tarp should be secured around the tank to prevent excess rusting. None of the other equipment has any possible physical hazards associated when not in use, which does not occur on the premises beyond a simple cleaning of the sprayer hose and attachment. So home occupancy permit provisions. Number one is clearly incidental and secondary to the use of the premises for residential purposes. Work occurs elsewhere by nature of the business. Number two, does not produce offensive noise, vibration, smoke, dust, odors, heat, lighting, electrical interference, radioactive emission, or environmental pollution. See previous sections for those aspects that are applicable. Does not use, um, sorry, number three, does not use exterior storage of material or equipment, including the parking of commercial vehicles. The open five by eight trailer with the four by two tank can easily be stored in the back section of the driveway away from standard egress and barely visible from the street. Number four, is conducted within a dwelling or within a building ex accessory to a dwelling solely by the person occupying the dwelling as a primary residence and in addition to the residence of the premises by not more than one additional employee, not a resident. Mr. Meridian is the sole employee of this business and the primary resident of 42 Arnodale Avenue. While the services provided by the business occur elsewhere, the home of the business would be the dwelling as Mr. Meridian would do all the other business related activities at this address. Number five, does not exhibit any exterior indication of its presence or any variation from residential appearance except for a sign or nameplate in compliance with this ordinance. A small sign on the trailer designating Flow's services is the only visible evidence. I appreciate the concerns of the neighbors and of the council members and with the modifications, further details discussed above, I believe that Mr. Meridian has met all of the qualifications to a obtain a home occupancy permit for flow services to operate at 42 Arterdale Avenue. I'm open to any and all substantive discussions regarding this matter, including logical conditions as part of this issuance of the permit. Thank you for consideration. Dylan A. Bradford, 502 East State Street, Granby, Mass, and his phone number and his email, which are on the screen. That's just a, we don't okay. All right. I think the rest is very yeah. technical yeah. information. I would know, I would want to know this if All I right. could. Yeah, so I would just note that there's a seal master safety data sheet present, um, and that includes all the chemical names and ingredients, um, and what to do when handling these items for safety in case of any accidental, accidental release, uh, the chemical properties, the stability and reactivities, toxicology, disposal operations, and transportation information, as well as regulatory information um, are all attached. Oh, I need some water. <laughs> Here's some, I want to get a mint or something. Mm. All right. So since the public hearing is open, um, I would invite Mr. Bradford if you'd like to add anything to this before we continue. This is pretty thorough. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thank you. Um, 
So are there any members of the public who would like to speak on this? Yes, so if you'll just come to the microphone, state your name and address, please. Yeah, there should be a button on it. Uh, Arthur Nats, 19 Arnoldale Avenue. Um, well, Mr. Bradford's letter was very thorough and seems like everything's been uh, addressed in our last meeting. It still doesn't talk about the odor. And the MSDS sheets from Sealmaster probably say the same thing as the ones I have. The odor, the odor, if you're doing a driveway or sidewalk or whatever, remains for 48 to 120 hours, depending on the temperature out, outdoors. So no one is going to get away from that odor if you have a tank with the product in it, whether it's left over from the job or going to the job. It's, the odor is still there. There's nothing you can do about it. And as far as cleaning goes, it's not just soap and water. Water is an important part of an emulsion application. That's something I just learned. However, when you put it on, the water is necessary so you can squeegee it or spray it or whatever, but then it separates from the tar-based product. And emulsion is still a tar-based product. So you're going to have that odor. It's called breaking. So when the product, uh, when the emulsion material breaks from the water, then it starts the tacking process and it takes 48 hours to cure. During that process, it smells. And if I choose to have my driveway done, I gotta live with the smell for a while. And I gotta let the neighbors know. So the no odor part and especially in the proximity of our neighborhood, the houses are tight. So it's going to smell. And I'm downwind, too. So I've smelled the product. Recording stopped. It's OK. You can You're fine. Keep going. OK. So I've smelled the product. And it's, I, it's not a proper place for this business. I'm not trying to be uh, really hard on uh, Mr. Meridian, but uh, there's a proper business area where this product should be stored. I have no problem with him doing his business, but uh, not in the neighborhood, not having that in the neighborhood. Clean up, it's mineral oil, soap, and water. Mineral oil helps break the product so that it's washable. Um, so hosing it off, it also recommends that you don't hose it off and just let it run into the drain. That, uh, that still causes a problem. They recommend an inert material for cleanup, being clay, kitty litter, sand, dirt of some sort, shoveling it up, bagging it, those type of things. There's no way that he can say that he's not going to have a release from his trailer, from his tank, when he's cleaning, any, anything like that. He doesn't have like a secondary tank or a contained area for it to flow into. So I'm a businessman, I'm in construction, and this is not the right type of business for a residential community. Thank you. Thank you. Is there, an, are there any other members of the public who would like to speak on this? Is there anyone online? Seeing no one. Um, uh, from committee members, are there any comments or questions? There, there was one on Zoom. Oh. I don't just see that. His iPhone. Just labeled his iPhone right now. They, they took it. I don't. It's labeled as iPhone, but I don't see it. Um, let's see. Oh, I see. So the person who's labeled as iPhone, would you mo please uh, state your name and address, and then you can um, speak. Uh, 
If you are speaking, it's on mute. They're on mute, so even if they responded, I wouldn't well, they know. Did? Okay. <laughs> While they're trying to figure out how to connect or respond, are there any questions from the committee or comments? Yeah, I, I was wondering if we can have um, Attorney Manoleski um, weigh in because I did reach out with concerns. <clears throat> Attorney Manoleski, are you available? Hey. I, I am. Hello. Motion to suspend our rules and allow Attorney Mantaleski to speak. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you, um, counselors, for having me tonight. Uh, so I did have the opportunity to take a look at um, our ordinance just to make sure um, I understood it and um, looked back at the intent and um, really tried to see if this was a type of a, a business that would fit within the definition of a home occupation. Um, our ordinances um, section is 4.8 for home occupation. And under our definition, a home occupation is a business use customarily conducted entirely within a dwelling carried on by the inhabitants thereof which is clearly incidental to the use of the dwelling as a place of residence. So, and then it goes on to talk about a professional home occupation, which is a professional office, which this does not apply to. Um, I looked at the application. This looks like it, it, it wouldn't fall under 481, which is a use as of right, right? Which is why um, the applicant is seeking a special permit under 482. I. Uh, Ha Recording I'm in not progress. I'm not sure that um, this use fits within the de definition of home occupation. Um, I, ha I, I have concerns with it fitting within um, 4824. Um, I know, which is saying it's conducted within a dwelling or within a building accessory to a dwelling. Uh, simply because the actual business activities, um, presumably besides phone calls and other managerial and administrative tasks, are going to be completed um, for the application um, off-premise. Uh, I think that um, the, uh, the council should take into concern um, the uh, neighborhood concerns regarding um, noise or smell under section two and that it is within um, the discretion of the the council to deny this permit based upon those um, i think that that should be the analysis that the council looks at um, mainly this is a business that is essentially being for the most part the business activities are done off-site so by those terms alone I don't think it necessarily fits within the definition under our ordinances of a home occupation. Thank you, Attorney Mantaleski. You're welcome. Do we, do we have the other person? Um, I, iPhone. Oh. iPhone, are you available? Florin. Yeah. No. Did you have a question, Counselor? No, I'm ready to close the public hearing. Okay. Make a motion to close the public hearing. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Um, so what I'm hearing here from Attorney Manaleski is that in, this actually doesn't qualify. Um, for a home occupancy permit because it's not work done on the premises. Um, I personally don't have any issues with this business. I thought, you know, considering that things are just stored there and, and the work is being off-site, that it would 
not be a burden to neighbors, but it sounds like according to our ordinances um, that it, he doesn't qualify for this type of permit anyway. So I would um, entertain a motion from the body. Well, I've got my hand raised. Oh, sorry. Thanks a lot. Councilor Bartley right, is also you. present. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, uh, through Chair Attorney Manzalewski, mm -hmm. just say again, uh, Jane, exactly why this doesn't qualify for 4.82, because I missed your argument uh, on that. So w when I read this, it, yeah, go ahead. Just, just tell me again what, what it is that you, you find at fault. Uh, so under 4.82, my um, fault, well, one, I think the, the council should take into consideration um, the concerns of the neighbors, right? But primarily, um, well, under 4824, is conducted within a dwelling or within a building accessory to a dwelling. And that the primary activities per the application um, provided that the activities, the primary activities are going to be conducted off-site by the nature of the business. Well, first of all, where, where does it say in, in the in the ordinance about the, the neighbors? Just, just point that out to me about the, the, the consideration. They, we are taking the, the neighbors' voices into consideration, but where, where is it in the, that we have to take in the neighbors' consideration? That's just generally in special permits. So, when so you it's, not, it's, not, it's not in here. Yeah, so it's not in here is what you're saying. Right. Yep. Okay. Okay. So we, we clearly take in neighbors' considerations all the time. But, and that's just right. your personal opinion on that. That has nothing to do with the law. Well, that's not my personal opinion on that, no. That's under the state law, Section mm -hmm. 9, 48, Section 9. You give notice of a public hearing to all of butters, and um, you, you do have to hear all of those considerations. So I think that that is something the city council If she bangs her hand consider. one more time, Madam Chair. What that, are you going to do? What are you going to do? Excuse me. Just call you out. Councilor Devine, Councilor Bartley, that. that's enough. Thank you. That's enough for me. How about for her? Can I just I? said Councillor Devine and Councillor Bartley. That's yeah. enough. Oh, sorry. Yeah, grow Thank up. you. Um, okay. So and just so I'm clear, it's where does it say in here, it says it's clearly incidental and secondary to the use of the premises. Would you agree this is incidental and second, secondary to use of the premises? I don't think it's a residential use. So I would say we'd have to look at the definitions of secondary or incidental. So is that a yes or a no? That's a, I think we have to look at the definitions of incidental and... Well, wouldn't you be prepared to answer? I mean, I assume you're prepared to answer this beforehand because you would have looked at it I'm prepared beforehand. to tell you that I don't think the council should allow it under Section 4 because it's not conducted within a dwelling or within a building accessory to a dwelling. Wow. Okay. Uh, it says, in, is clearly incidental and secondary to the use of the premises for residential purposes. I'm just going to say, as a common sense and a person who kind of understands the English language, this... Mr. This Bartley, come on. We don't have to attack take, everybody. Yeah, you know, I take issue with that. We all speak Bartley, English and we all understand the language. Come on. Speak English. Ma ma Madam Chair, uh, really. Counselor. Please, knock it Counselor. Now, you don't have a right to... Counselor. So, it, the incidental and secondary. The, his business is not... Jesus. primary to his residential purpose at best it would be secondary in other words the his residential is is where he lives the business has nothing to do with the residence thus I'm gonna say that at best it's secondary I'm also gonna say he has a full-time job so this it's incidental in the in that incidental means it's just part of part of his his life but it's not his life it's got nothing to do with the premises so that's why i said as me and i didn't say your understanding of this my understanding of the english language is incidental and second secondary kind of allows this use if you look at number two does not produce offensive noise vibration smoke dust orders heat lighting electrical inter interference radioactive emission or environmental pollution now i heard from what a butter that it may produce odor, but there's no there's no kind of evidence uh, of that. And I think in order to give this guy half a break, you could you could put a condition on here that the city would allow the use so long as there are no offensive odors that are dis that can be distinguished. So that would be another thought. Number three does not utilize exterior storage of material or equipment well 
I mean, there, there, you go, there you go. I mean, he doesn't. So it is concluded, is conducted within a dwelling or within a building accessory to a dwelling. And the building accessory to a dwelling, that's number four, is his garage. And so they've, he's agreed to put it within the garage. I, I'm, I'm sure you watched the prior meeting where he agreed to that, wherever it was, April something or other. And then, so that would cover number four, I believe, and uh, does not exhibit any exterior indication of his presence or any variation from residential appearance except for a sign except for a sign or a nameplate in compliance with the ordinance. And he doesn't even want a sign or a nameplate. So again, I, I have to ask you, uh, you know, I mean I think I checked every box on here. I have to ask you, you you're you're guiding this body and you're saying it doesn't comply. But I'm but I'm reading through this, it complies with every single point. And I understand that, uh, Councillor Bartley, you and I have different interpretations of certain language, um, and specifically number four. Um, my concern is not that he's going to be utilizing certain parts of his garage for storage. It's that his primary business activity is steel coating. It's not storage, it's steel coating. And that is done by its nature, not on premise. So that is our difference. And it's okay that you disagree with me. It's okay that you don't agree with my interpretation. That is my legal interpretation. And as it's been stated in this council by you and other colleagues of yours previously, you don't necessarily have to take my interpretation. All I can do is tell you my interpretation in the, in the city solicitor's office, interp office's interpretation. Just know that in the event that you don't agree with it, and the majority of the council doesn't agree with it, and they allow the special permit, that's fine. Just know that there's a possibility of appeal, and then I'm gonna to have to try to defend the city and make arguments regarding that. So at this point, based upon all the information we have today, and as of April as well, it is the law department's opinion that this is not, this does not fit within 4824. Well, I would love for Mr. Um, for the applicant to continue his business just like in an industrial zone. Let, let me just give one more hypothetical. If I open a lawnmower business and I'm cutting grass, now, and I ask for a home occupancy permit because I want to start a business, I'm going to store the lawnmower in my garage. But clearly, I'm not going to be cutting lawns in my garage. I'm going to have to unbelievably take the lawnmower out of my garage and go cut people's lawns. What the applicant is, and tell me how this applicant is different from a lawnmower business. In other words, he's just mixing his stuff in the garage, but he's running his business by seal coating elsewhere. So tell me how is that, how is that different from a lawnmower business? Well, it's not. I mean, clearly it's not because he, he does one thing in the garage. It looks like I store my lawnmower in my garage, but I, I make the money out in the public. That's how he makes his money out in the public. So I don't understand how your rationale says he has to conduct a business inside the dwelling. That's not what the ordinance says. But that's exactly what the ordinance says. And I don't think necessarily, I'm not, well, I'm not going to talk about hypotheticals here because that's not, we're not in a hypothetical situation. We're in a real world situation. And I live in the real world and I am looking at this specific situation. And under our ordinance, the primary activity of this business is off-site. So again, you don't have to agree with me. That's okay. You know, the council doesn't have to necessarily agree with me, and that's okay too. Just know, as I advised you now and I advised earlier, that in the event there's an appeal, there's going to have to be arguments made. And I'm going to tell you the back and forth of those arguments, and that's where I, that's where I end up on those arguments. All right, so thank you. Uh, so, Madam Chair and Committee, uh, you, you know, so that, that's what you heard right there was a, I, I gave my analysis, Jane gave her analysis, we obviously disagree. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think the um, threat of an appeal is always, is, it's always a threat, right? How about the appeal to have a denial? Now, you didn't hear, you didn't hear that either, because that could happen as well. So, there, it could be an appeal from either side. Even Attorney Mantileski would probably agree with me on that one, I think. Mm -hmm. So, so whoever loses, could appeal. So don't let the, the, I mean, that's a kind of a quasi scare tactic, you know, we're, we're a threat of a lawsuit. So I, I don't even think there's a reasonable possibility of that. Look, I, I, I think you can put enough conditions on this under 9.4.2. 
uh, to really make sure that the neighbors are fully and completely satisfied with the business and the operation thereof. Now, you're gonna recommend what you recommend and then we'll take a vote on it in two weeks, um, but that's as good as I got. Thank you, Councillor Bartley, and thank you. Um, Attorney Mantileski, I do have a question regarding this. Um, so, for this business to work, because it, it seems to me if these items are stored in a garage and all the work is off-site, there's no mixing on site. There's materials picked up off site, taken directly to um, wherever the work is being done. My question is what kind of permit would this person need, in your opinion, in order to accomplish these goals and have this business? Um, if, if you can't, according to your interpretation, if you can't store your your business on site for offsite, how can you have a, a business by yourself where you store everything at home but still do the business offsite? I think the, we have to look back at the intent of why, where this, um, this ordinance came from, your, the definition of the ordinance, and I think you have to look at that and make that, have that analysis. When it, you think of generally home occupations, um, you can have, you know, accountants, attorneys, sometimes will do it, um, their practice at home, especially now in the virtual age. Um, the, um, any type of bookkeeping, stenographers, I just, I'm just taking from my, you know, area um, of what I know people do from home. Um, I've seen also, which probably would fit under um, maybe not 481, but 482, a yoga studio, um, things like that, um, where you conduct the business within the home, solely within the home, not for offsite business. So, what would so, you need for an offsite business? That I'm going to have to, I don't, unfortunately, I don't have an answer for you tonight. Um, I'd have to look deeper into the ordinance um, to see what he may need. Um, I don't think there would be any problem if he was simply conducting, you know, um, like a bookkeeping business or something like that on his property. That's fine. You get a business certificate from the city clerk's office. Um, so what if the, I mean, if, if, the, if he has a business that's at his home, he's probably doing paperwork at home and taking calls at home, you know, so it's probably partially his office would be at home. Would that qualify? If he had a professional office that was solely limited to professional um, items or just clerical managerial and he, he didn't have any sort of storage of any sort of or any mixing or any of that stuff happening on site mm. um, I think that could potentially fit in yes mm. I, I agree that you know I don't think it's a perfect you know ordinance I don't think it's a a um, one-size-fits-all right and, it, and it's, it's difficult um, what would be, I think, if he was able to potentially um, have space in the industrial zone, right, to store his, um, store whatever he had there that was potentially noxious or um, do his mixing there and getting his cleaning done there, I think is different, right? Um, so I, I understand that it's hard and, you know, I want I, I think, you know, the... Well, it just sounds like the, this ordinance isn't the right one to pass right. a permit under. We're just trying to figure out which one it is. Councillor um, Anderson Burgess, you had a question? Yeah, not a question. I want to make a statement. So yeah. uh, the information that was provided to us by the landlord, um, there's a document here by Sealmaster, safety data sheet. Um, so while I'm reading the safety data sheet... You go down to where it says hazardous, hazardous um, identification. It says here, this chemical is not considered hazardous according to OSHA hazard communication standard. Um, but then it says emergency overview. 
and it has a warning, harmful if swallowed, may cause skin irritation. And it continues, and it says here, general, general advice, keep container tightly closed, dispose of material containers in accordance with appropriate state, regional, or local regulations. It says here, skin contact, wash immediately with soap and plenty of water in case of skin irritation or allergic reactions, see a physician. In inhaling, so move to fresh air. If symptoms persist, call a physician. Ingestion, drink plenty of water. There, there are too many red flags here. I do not feel comfortable approving this special permit. This is not your regular chemical. It can't be considered or anywhere near a lawnmower. I, out of the safety of my constituents and constituents around the city, I have an obligation to make sure that these constituents are safe. I've seen way too many stories and seen too many incidents where chemicals do get released. People get sick, people die of cancer. Now I'm not saying that this would be the case here, but I don't want to hear a case from something that I could have you know, prevented. I'm just gonna give that information now. I'm declining. Thank you, Councillor. Um, Councillor Devon, and then Thank Councillor you. Bartley. Um, just looking at the home occupation, occup occupancy permit provisions, number two, does not produce offensive noise, vibration, smoke, dust, odors. And we've already heard from one of the neighbors that the odor does, is, does exist. The other one is under number three, the open five foot by eight foot trailer with the four by two tank can easily be stored in the back section of the driveway, away from standard egress and barely visible from the street. It's not being stored in the garage. And the other thing is uh, under four, second paragraph, while the services provided by the business occur elsewhere, the home of the business would be the dwelling as Mr. Muradian would do all other business related activities at this address that doesn't tell me what all other businesses are. So I'm inclined to deny this and uh, see if there's another ordinance that he can use to run his business or to find a place off premises that he can run this business. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor uh, Sullivan. Yeah, I would just say why I, I, I don't share some of the concerns about the toxicity of the product. Uh, the fact that it, uh, one of its main ingredients is asphaltic. Uh, no one can tell me that any asphaltic-based product doesn't produce a very strong odor. So, um, you know, that, that, that in itself, the fact that it's asphaltic-based, it is going to emit a strong odor, and I have to agree with the neighbors on that. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Bartley. Well, I, I don't know and who anybody at this table or in this room is an expert on uh, odor emittance. So, and I think he also indicated that it would be uh, locked down completely. So if somebody's worried about chemicals, I would suggest that they shouldn't probably procure uh, Drano for the house because if you drink that, you're, you're probably gonna be awfully, awfully sick. And that's an over-the-counter product. So I think there's very little chance that anybody's gonna consume the uh, stuff. Just on number four, the, the, the lawyer is saying that that's the hook to deny it, but almost making it sound like the business has to be exclusively conducted. I mean, th that has almost a ridiculous result to it and a ridiculous interpretation, in my opinion. There's no way that a home occupancy permit has to, everything has to be done exclusively within the four corners of the house. Common sense tells me that home occupancy allows you to have a business and have a DBA at 123 Main Street or 42 Aaron, whatever it is, so you can set up shop, do what you have to do, 
Well, it doesn't say you have to do everything. That's why I gave my hypothetical, which we, I guess we couldn't accept, about a lawnmower business. You can still have a business. This is the right ordinance. You can still have a business within your house and you can go outside the four corners of the lot and conduct your business with money and, and make money. This does not force you to have exclusive, exclusive exclusivity within that house. Uh, th to me, again, I think that's a red herring. I think it's made up. Uh, I don't think, and, if, and, if you, and, and clearly the, the lawyer wasn't ready to have a, uh, an understanding of a definition of incidental and secondary which is what I simply said was, that's the common, it was common English words. I think this is incidental to his residence. It's got nothing to do with being a resident of that premises. It's secondary to the residence. He, he, he sleeps there. He doesn't dream about asphalt uh, when, when, he, when he's in there. Um, so I, I, I think that there's, now the question of the odors, listen, I, even if I, even if we go that route, and, and I respect Councilor Sullivan so much, and he has so much experience, vast experience with all this. As I said, you can condition it, for example, to, to, to demand permitting, to demand, to demand testing on site. And if it hits a level where it's noticeable or meets whatever levels there are, I mean, I'm talking out of school because I have no idea what I'm talking about, but you can require that hmm. as a condition on, uh, as a special permit. And it can be tested every three months, or whatever you think is reasonable, at his expense, to be, re be reviewed by the Board of Health. And if it flunks, he knows now he flunked. But right now, we have a total guessing game. Because we, we don't have any expert witnesses here, and we have no data relative to this business. Now, you may have said, well, it's his burden to get the data. He's a one-man band. It's a small business. He operated a similar business in Westfield. It seems to go well. Now he's trying to do something similar here in, in Holyoke. Could you possibly say, yes, the burden is on you, sir? Yes, you could. But I think a, a more fair way to do it is to say, the burden is going to be on you, Mr. Applicant, going forward. If we put this condition on there, you're going to have to do the testing, and you're going to have to produce the testing to the health department for their review on a, on a regular basis and for, for the duration of the permit. And if it changes, bye-bye permit. But if it doesn't change, he gets, his, he gets his business, then the neighbors are okay. Now, can, I heard Juan said, you know, listen, he raises good points. Is stuff scary in life? It, it is. There's a lot of stuff that's scary. That's why I, I, I wasn't being flippant when I said Drano, but you know, people buy Drano all the time. I mean, yeah. you read the back of that bottle? Holy cow. I mean, you, you breathe it in, you, you, you have a sip, you're, you're in big trouble. But that's a common household product. This is gonna be lock and keyed, and you, you, read, the, you read his report, he, it was a heck of a time opening the thing. Mm -hmm. and, and he can secure it even more. So I, I would, Look, you know, you gotta do what you gotta do, but you know, chew on all of that and go from there. Thank you, Counselor. Uh, Attorney Mentaleski, uh, you have your hand up. Thank you. Yes, I just wanted to address one um, thing that Counselor Bartley said, um, and I agree with him that it would be a ridiculous interpretation um, that. Um, to say that everything related to a business that is a home occupation needs to be with, done within the home. For example, lawyers, right? They do a lot of their, their paperwork and probably client calls um, if they have a solo practitioner or their solo practitioners in their home or small office space, but they may go to court, right? Um, they go to court as um, a part of their practice as well. I think the distinction that needs to be made here that um, the main activity of the business is the seal coating and that is done off-site it's that is not an incidental activity like bookkeeping that he would be doing at the home um, this is uh, seal coating which is being done elsewhere so well I would agree with Councillor Bartley that obviously that would be a, a, a not reasonable interpret an unreasonable interpretation um, that wasn't the, the, the point I was trying to make. The point is that under the ordinance, 
the primary activity of the business is not being done within the home or an accessory structure. And so I just wanted to make that distinction. Thank you, attorney. Do we have any other questions? Or, oh, Councilor Devine. Comment. Um, in the letter from uh, Dylan Bradford, uh, second paragraph, it says, I contacted each of the neighbors that presented at the 422 meeting so that we could discuss and determine a path forward that would work for all parties. I met with Mrs. Natz, who reiterated, reiterated her concerns about possible smells reaching her home located 100 yards down the road due to her medical sensitivity and general environmental problems if a spill of the seal coating material were to occur. So I just wanted to put that into the record. Thank you, Councillor. Any other questions? Uh, Councillor Ocasio. Um, <coughs> question is, how, lo how long has Mr. What's his name? Mir Mirandin? Mirandin has been uh, living there. Oh. Yes. Six years. Six years. Okay, so in six years, as of today, you never had a problem with the neighbors saying that they smell anything or that you spill anything or anything for six years. Mm -hmm. you, you never, you had, in six years, you didn't have no complaints from your neighbors. Mm -mm. Okay. So what, um, I'm just curious, so what's the difference from six years, you know, that, that you've been living there and as of now, you know, what, what, is the smell too strong now than six years ago or? If I can answer that. So since the, so, okay. so this is not a public hearing, unfortunately, so counselor, we can't really ask questions to the public, but the answer is that this, um, the answer is that the business has been conducted previously offsite in Westfield, and he's trying to bring the business to Holyoke. If I may. And it probably wasn't until he applied for the home occupation um, where they notify the abutters that they had the problems with the smell and other things. Thank you, Counselor. Do we have any other questions or comments? Um, well, this is, I'm not sure what the will of the body is. Um, it seems like we're a I'd, little bit conflicted, but. I'd make a motion to deny the permit. Second. We've already closed the. Public yeah, speaking. Do respect the, the the public speaking portion of it. It's closed. So there no. was a motion. What was the motion? To deny the permit. And one seconded it. And I seconded it. So now we vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? No. Counselor. Aye. So four aye. Four eight. Counselor Ocasio. So we have one abstain. One abstain. Really? Councilor Ocasio has left the room. So we have. Well, I think you have to find out about the abstaining. Madam Chair, may I make a point of order, please? Yes, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just this is always through the chair, and and what this is to Mr. Bradford, what Councillor Anderson Burgo said was absolutely correct. So I can't say we do this all the time. When we close the public hearing, we close the public hearing. Now, two things: could we make a motion and reconsider it? Yes, we could, but you you, you know it's a long agenda. So I agree with Councillor Anderson Burgo. We close it. However. There is an opportunity to speak, as Councilor Anderson Burgos knows, when we next meet and vote on this for real on June 18th. 
and we have public comment. So anybody is welcome to come up to that microphone, sign a piece of paper, and we've changed our rules. You get now two whole minutes to address this esteemed body. I'll tell you, and how exciting is that gonna be in your life? So if you wanna put your thoughts together, you can come up and address that, or you have the th another option. You can send a communication, this is point of order, this is all it, you can send mm -hmm. a communication to the city clerk and ask that it be put on, you know, on point, on, you know, relevant, you don't get into personalities, just get onto the, onto the matter, relevant, and have it be sent for a communication to the 618 agenda. So you have other opportunities to address us relative to your questions, okay? That's my point of order. Thank you, Councilor Thank you. Bartley, those are really good points. Um, we are meeting June 18th on Tuesday, public hearings, um, public comment is at the beginning of meeting, so you get to speak right away. Um, so I have three A's and one no, so that is being um, recommended to council to vote against this. What, what is the vote again? It's three yeses and one no for me and one abstain. Who's abstaining? Councilor Ocasio. But she, can we, uh, I don't understand how you can. No, no due respect. Microphone. I let everybody say their piece, right? But when I'm speaking, I would like the same respect back. I don't like to be in trouble. I didn't realize you weren't done. You know, Sorry. So that is a problem. You know, I don't, I don't like that. So. I, I will, I'm going to vote yes. Okay. So four yes, one nay. Recommend, recommend this go to council um, with that recommendation. Thank you. Entertain motion to motion. take up item number two. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. So motion, item number two is a petition for Felix. Item two, petition for Felix Rive Rivera Soto Jr. application for a street vendor license. I don't have a number. Here, I've got an extra one. Oh, there you go. Oh, oh you have an extra one. Well, hmm. I don't how know convenient. why. <laughs> I don't know how. <laughs> All right. Is a street vendor license? Is, um... Mr. Felix Risotto, um, Mr. Felix Rivera Soto Jr. here. Yeah. All right. Would you like to speak on this? Let us know what you're doing. Give us a recap. Sure. All right. So no if you, yeah, we don't. Not normally. Can you can come to the microphone? Uh, just state your name and address, and um, yeah, let us know what you're doing. Uh, yeah. Hi, my name is Felix, and. I live in 647 Handon Street, mm -hmm. and I'm here to register for the street lift vendor's license. Mm -hmm. So this is a, a cart, not a truck, correct? Yeah, it's a cart. Mm -hmm. And do you have hours of operation? Uh, yes, it will be... Um, from 9 a.m. to 3.30, mm -hmm. um, Mondays through Friday. M 9 to 3.30, Monday through Friday? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what's, I see the permit here, is there an approval? So I see you're still awaiting approval of your permit? Yep. Or do you already have the no, permit? Oh, we got it right okay. now. Okay. Um, <laughs> do we have any questions from the body? I'm just curious. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, there it is. 
Oh, it's double-sided. Sorry. It's okay. I just have a question. Again, I, I just it says the permit date four two twenty four, application date four two twenty four, expiration date five two twenty four. I wonder if that's a mistake, yeah, a typo. Yeah, it's a mistake. It's supposed to be for um, a year until next year. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I had a question um, mm -hmm. to the city councils because I don't know the answer to it. So right now, uh, they have the the hot dog truck on city property on the lot. So would that be a problem for them in the future, or can because uh, it doesn't stay here exactly where it's going to be at? It just say corner south bridge and Kevin. Okay. Yeah, I was going to ask yeah. that too. Corner, yeah. Gonna, yeah, right at yeah. the corner. So, but they have it right on the lot. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I don't know if that's going to be a problem, you know, later on for them. I think that's a good question. Yeah. Um, this was um, submitted to the Board of Health with this address on it. So I would hope that they considered that when granting this. Yes. So this is to certify that the permission is hereby granted. Approved for food truck Sabrosito to be located on Cabbage Street between South Summer and South Bridge Streets. It doesn't address your question of it being on city property on a lot. Um, hmm. That's a good question. Um, Attorney Manileski, are you present or Attorney Bissonette? Anybody? <laughs> Thank you, Attorney Bissonette. Did you hear the question? Good oh, evening. You're... Yes, I did. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm going to have to uh, defer to the Board of Health, uh, which would uh, usually check to see the location. Um, I'm not sure if the documents you have would have that diagram, mm. but that's, uh, I understand that one of the things that they look at <coughs> are all food trucks that are in a stationary location. Yeah. Are food trucks that are stationary uh, primarily on the sidewalk? Because that's where I usually see them, either right on the street or right on the sidewalk. Some are in public parking areas yeah. that are owned by the city, often um, adjacent to the sidewalk. I've seen that. Bring it up. No. I'm not sure that there's a complete map of them. That might be a worthwhile endeavor. I mean, we can use the Google. Uh -huh. So can I? Madam Chair. Oh um, yeah, Councillor Sullivan. And Attorney, so we do have a permit uh, to obstruct the public way from the DPW, mm -hmm. uh, stating that it will be on Cabot Street between South Summer, right. and South Bridge. So I, I think it they kind like of check that box. Yeah. Um, the mobile food permit from the Board of Health has this been signed by the uh, yes. director of the Board of Health? Has approved it. Yep. So it's been approved by mm -hmm. both the DPW and the Board of Health. Yeah. So we should be in order, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So. Uh, can I if, just ask a quick, quick question? Councilor Devine. Um, where is this in relation to um, what used to be Pat Supermarket and the pizza place going down Cabot? If, um, if you're coming down from Main Street, down Cabot Street, uh, there are... Where the, the where the truck is at is right in the corner lot okay. of South Bridge and Cabot Street, but I, I believe that that's a a city property. Okay. So, and there's because the, in the side the sidewalk is too too narrow for them to put it right on the sidewalk. People right. won't be able to pass by. Right. So, and if they put it on the street, it's going to be too far. Right. Too close to the. The cross flying yeah. by. Yeah. Yeah. So the only place that they could have it is right on that lot. Oh, okay. That's the only space. So I just don't want them, you know, yeah. to to get into any trouble if it's not right. Yeah. No, that's reasonable. 
right. Well, um, what's the will of the body? Well, if, to me, if mm -hmm. everything's signed, sealed, and delivered, we should uh, approve it. All right. I'll entertain a motion. Motion to approve the special permit. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. We'll be recommending this to the council for approval. Thank you so much. All right. Motion. Motion to take up item number three. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, item three, petition for William F. Sullivan and Company, Inc. of 107 Appleton Street for junk dealer's license. We want to deal with three and four as a package. Um, sure. Is that seconded? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. So motion to take up items two and three together as three a package. I'm sorry. Three and four as a package. Um, four is one is one of one to three Jed Days Landing for a junk dealer's license. Um, I also don't have a number three. Patty stole all of mine. I could, <laughs> well, three, three is for the same 107 Appleton. Okay. William F. Sullivan, no relation for the record. Yeah. <laughs> is is, um, the, is uh, Mr. William F. Sullivan present? Thank you. So just state your name and your address and let us know what's up. Uh, actually, I'm, my name is Brian Powell. Oh, hi. President of William F. Sullivan Company. Okay. Uh, my home address is uh, in Ellington, Connecticut, but the business address is obviously at 107 Appleton Street and 1 to 3 Jed Days Landing. All okay. right. Uh, we're seeking a renewal on our junk license for both locations. Mm -hmm. uh, we've been in the city for 70 plus years doing the same thing. Um, and so we're just looking to keep on doing what we've been doing. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Whenever. Um, Councilor Devine? Yeah. Um, how long did you say you've been in business for this? 70 plus. Since 1953. Wow. 1953. And no problems, anything like that? Uh, none that I'm aware of, ma'am. Okay. I just want to let you know that um, I did receive an email, and I'm assuming the other counselors did. It was sent by ad our administrative assistant. I don't know if you're aware of it. No. From Jeffrey, and I may mess up his name, Biancini. And I reside and work at 62 Main Street, providing me with a direct view of the Sullivan Scrapyard. I have been at this location since 2008. I understand that the application for Sullivan Metal Scrapyard permit is up for renewal and I would like to bring to your attention some concerns shared by myself and other residents in the neighborhood. And again, I'm reading this, and it's not to say that you can't straighten out some things that he's complaining about. Um, while I am not attempting to oppose the permit renewal or hinder a Hoyoke business from operating, I believe this is an opportune, opportune moment to address, address these issues and explore reasonable accommodations to attach to enhance the quality of life for those of us living in the downtown Hoyoke. First, there is an issue with noise. Re regularly before dawn at around 5 a.m. or earlier, the machinery at the scrapyard begins operating. So maybe that's something that you can deal with. Um, the beeping of multiple overlapping trucks creates a disturbance that lasts for five to 10 minutes. Like alarm clocks, we cannot silence. Following this, the noise of smashing and pouring metal commences. During the day, the repetitive and loud noises become torturous as we try to work in the shop. While I understand this is part of living in an industrial city, perhaps we could find a balance. Second, there are concerns regarding air quality and safety. Frequently, we observe smoke emanating from the scrapyard that can only be described as questionable with fires or burning pits producing blue, green, and yellow smoke. We have also witnessed large uncontrolled fires on the hillside. Additionally, there have been instances where the blinding light of an arc welder is visible in the open. While I assume the welder uses eye protection, the same cannot be said for the residents walking past or passengers on the train. The scrapyard predates my arrival and has been an integral part of d the downtown Hoyoke for many decades, providing jobs and contributing to its industrial landscape. But with the elementary school adjacent, several apartment buildings on Bower Street facing the scrapyard, 
and the residents at the cubic and soon to be open wind project nearby. I believe it is crucial to consider some accommodations for improving the quality of life in downtown Hoyoke when renewing this permit. Thank you for your time and consideration. Uh, sincerely, Jeffrey Bianchini, uh, Hoyoke Ward 1 resident. So I wanted you to be aware of that. And my biggest concern, obviously, if, if I live there and the noise start at 5 o'clock, I'd be, you know, if that's true. And then the fires. I, I'm, I wanted, the first thing I wanted to do was say, should we have the fire department go down and check this out? I just don't know. Um, I, I, I'm not sure what they're referring to as far as fires. We did have a fire overnight uh, recently. Uh, that is a very rare occurrence. It's not, we're not actively burning any material. Everything that we do there is cut mechanically. Um, there is welding going on as part of our operation for maintenance. Uh, we do start early. We do start at 5 a.m. We do not start the machinery until 6 a.m. Uh, I'm very open to discussion about that. Uh, okay. This is the first time I'm hearing of this complaint. Okay. So you know, we're very open to discussion. We always are. Okay. Uh, we've been doing it for a very long time, and so we're very used to obviously dealing with the neighbors mm -hmm. and, and we're very open to do, dealing with the neighbors yeah. and having an open dialogue with them. Okay. Um, there are some things that we can't control. Our operation during the day is noisy uh, and the trucks do have backup alarms on them. They're supposed to. Yeah. But there are certain things that we can do to try to mitigate any concerns that folks may have. Okay. We're happy to do that. Um, Jeffrey's business is on Main Street. The print shop, is that what it's called? 62. 62 Main Street, the print shop. Maybe the two of you could talk. I would you know? love to have done okay. it beforehand. And I'm happy to give you this copy if you'd like. I would appreciate okay. that. Thank you. Because, like you said, you've been doing this business for since 1953. Yeah. Um, so we'll give you this letter and certainly talk to Jeff. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Devine. Anyone else on the committee have any questions, mm -hmm. comments? Um, I'm just curious of your hours of operation in general. So right now we're, we're operating, we have people come in at 5 a.m. to get started. Mm -hmm. We start running the machinery at 6 a.m. and we stop at about 4 to 4.30. Thank you. Monday through Friday? Monday through Friday okay. and on Saturday we're open to the public for residential drop-off from 7.30 till noon. Okay, thank you. Do any of the committee members have an idea of starting the operations i know there's an ordinance where you can't start an operation that's loud yeah there, uh, there's an I, I wasn't sure if it was seven in the morning or is yeah, it six i'm not sure Do we I, know? I don't i want to say eight but that that's what i thought too but i believe yeah. that's when you're doing lawnmowers and right yeah and so forth. well the noise yeah for the noise ordinance we'd need to know that um, that would be my only question too, yeah. Councilor. I mean, uh, yeah, yeah, Councilor yeah. Sullivan. Just, just to count up to you. First of all, it's, it's zoned industrial, and yeah. as people choose to take up residence or change into an industrial area, they they know what they're where they're moving, and we shouldn't be trying to uh, affect the businesses that have operated this way for a long time. As far as the noise goes, if we want to address something like this. We can address the Amtrak that rolls through there blowing its horn every morning at 4.30, <laughs> all right? So That's a good point. Myself, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, unless anybody else has any questions, I make a motion to approve both of these, uh, yep. renewal of both of these permits. I would second that, all especially favor. since you're going to be talking to Jeff. And he, his letter was very friendly. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm very open to doing that. Right. Thank you. <clears throat> no so motion is... To approve. Made and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. So we'll send this to City Council with the full support. Motion to take up item number five. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Item number five from. Hmm. So I would like to entertain a motion to take number nine out of order. Second. Or so moved. We have nine. Yeah, we have another public hearing. Oh. Oh, okay. it's under the laid table. <laughs> it's too. on the back. Of okay. Yeah. Anybody? Anybody? Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, so item nine is special permit application for Salmar Realty. 
um, for a proposed coffee shop drive through restaurant at South Street Plaza. This has been continued several times. Um, the latest was from April 22nd. Um, Motion open a public hearing. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Is there, oh, yeah. is there anyone here to speak on behalf of this public hearing for or against it? Owners, anybody? Oh, this might go real fast today. Uh, sure. Yeah. Oh, thank you, um, Jeffrey. Is someone online? Wanted no. Just wanted to make sure you saw that there is a letter from the petitioner there re requesting requesting another continuance. Oh, okay. I don't know. Um, Councilor Divine stole all my no, I did visuals. Because <laughs> <laughs> if I did, I'd see that letter, and I don't see a letter. So, oh, see, he, he stole. He stole it. <laughs> oh, thanks. All right. So let's see. From R. Levesque Associates Inc. Request for continuance. Perfect, uh, dear Councilor Governor and Committee members, on behalf of the applicant. Um, it's here and requesting that we continue the review of the above reference application for Thursday, June 6th to a date certain in July. All right, we don't have a July date yet. Let's see. The committee had originally continued this item in order to allow the City Planning Board to review and vote on the major site plan review application for the above re uh, reference project. Review by the City of Holyoke Planning Board is still pending and has been continued to their July 9th meeting. Please kindly confirm receipt. Uh, sincerely, Nina Fazio. Um, Jeffrey, Jeffrey, yes? Yeah, um, so when I received that email and confirmed with her that I had received it and would give it to the committee, I did let her know that the council does go on recess in July and I wasn't sure whether this committee would meet in July or not. So she's prepared that it may not be until August, depending on what you all decide to do. Do So since, to continue this, do we need a, a date in August right now? I think we just have one meeting in August. You would need a date certain to continue it. Is it already scheduled? I don't remember it's being scheduled already. Um, I do not believe so. Let's do those. How about, do we have anything scheduled Monday the 19th of August? Not yet. Nope, that day oh, is open. That would be my favorite day to do this. Does that work for everyone else here? Just a question. Um, we have a meet, one, only one meeting of city council in August. Yeah. Is that before the 19th? Jeffrey? The council meets on August 6th. So well, that's my birthday. I'm not well, going to be here. Day. Well, maybe before the 6th. <laughs> <laughs> um, before the 6th? That's a good idea. How about... Hmm. That would be the 5th. <laughs> or unless you wanted to do the end, very end of yeah, July. Yeah, just making my week a mess, huh? <laughs> Monday the 5th, does that work for everybody? Yep. Okay. So let's um, motion, motion to continue the public hearing until August 5th. Great. Give the time, Mike. <laughs> uh, 6 30. Second. All, right. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. So we'll continue this um, item number 9 to August 5th okay. at 6 30. Thank you, guys. Um, Madam Chair, mm -hmm. I wonder if we could suspend the necessary rules and take up item 7. And that should also include five Lindor and 15 Lindor Heights. Sure. Okay, thank you. Make a motion that we take up item seven. Second. Am I working from it? My seven is for Verizon. Yeah. My seven is for Conservation okay. Commission so be invited. So you have a different eight. agenda. Why are you using the same agenda? <laughs> I have no idea, but that's the agenda I have. I'm sorry. But these two, yeah, these two nice people. That's what we're trying to take up item eight. Okay. 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 Second for eight. Mo motion to take up item number Second. eight. Second. All in favor? Aye. 
Aye. Okay, great. So, item eight, the Cons Conservation Commissioner will be invited to attend a future DGR meeting to provide an update on the construction in and around Scott's Tower. Please be prepared to, to address the issue of water runoff to, to the pond owned by the abutter and at 5 and 15 Lindor Streets refer to DGR Conservation Commission. All right. So... Thanks, Conservation Commission. Welcome. I'd also like to mention that um, Councillor McGrath-Smith is present. We have two other guests also. Uh, and we have yeah, Andy guests. Fisk. Mm -hmm. Andy Fisk. No. <laughs> so this is Jeff Horan. Yeah. He's our okay, assistant nice. um, about yeah. that. Yep. vice chair of the yeah. Conservation Commission. And we also invited Mark Wamsley, who's the conservation director at Cons uh, Kestrel Lane Trust. Thank you. Who's been a collaborator on this project. Well, thanks for taking the time to come in and um, talk to us about what's going on. Um, have Madam a Chair? short. Madam Chair, since, yes. since I filed the order, I was kind of hoping I could get recognized first. Councilor Brightly, of course, my bad. Um, so I, I filed this order on behalf of a, a good friend of mine who owns a very large, a sizable pond that's on Route 141. Mm -hmm. And for months we, we've gone over there. His, his properties are five Lindor. And subsequent to that, it came to my attention that other properties, bodies of water have been affected. And what he's alleging, what he saw, in fact, what I saw, is the, the clear cutting from Overlook Drive up to Scott's Tower. And so many, many, many scores and scores of trees are, are cut and there's, there's a consequence to doing that. Namely, um, namely whether water runoff from snow or from, from rain, which would uh, traverse down a pretty steep slope, land at Overlook Drive, and subsequent to that, it would be an Overlook Drive is a cul-de-sac, Mike, is that fair? Yep. So it's a, it's a dead end and then it would travel down a slope from Overlook under Route 41 through a culvert mm -hmm. into the pond owned by the property owner at 5 Lindor. Now I, I've seen it, it's, it's, still, it's, still running, it it's, it's still running off. Now for months that was allowed just to flow down there. As a matter of fact, there are, there are drains, you know, catch basins, and there that were sealed off. I mean, you, nothing could go. Nothing could go in there. There was, a, for lack of a better phrase, there was an apron around the around the catch basin, so no water could flow into the catch basin and, and funnel down through storm pipes as we would normally see. And what happened was it would just funnel down to the low point on Overlook Drive, mm -hmm. and then it would go down a slope. At Route 1, go underneath 141 and stream into the pond. Now, beyond that, Madam Chair, what do I know about environmental stuff? Nothing. Okay, so let's be super clear on that. But we know, just being an observer, that water is coming down from Scotts Tower at a, at a a significant height above Overlook Drive, and water is running down and snow is there and it's melting and it's filled with silt and all sorts of other things. I don't know what's in there. I'm just saying it's filled, Councilor Sullivan can speak to it much more clearly than me. I'm just giving you what I, what I observed. And, and I did walk up to Scott's Tower through, through there. It looks like it's gonna be a nice project at some point, but there's a consequence to what they did. And the consequence, in my opinion, is the, the extreme wa water runoff that went down that slope. Now you may say to yourself, well, why didn't they, wh why did they seal off the catch basin? I, I don't know. Why didn't they put a block around the part that would prevent the water from running down the slope and then under 141? Eventually they did. Hmm. After months, it, didn't, it wasn't secured initially, and there's something called a waddle. Again, this is what they're telling me, Councilor, Madam Chair, I don't know, it's it just, it, a waddle is a huge, long, tube-like structure of straw and all that. It's pretty thick, pretty, it's thick like that, 
and it's used as a buffer to prevent water from running. So what, what happened is the water would pool right there and overlook, and then I think it just, just evaporated because, again, the catch basins were sealed off. I'm sure there was a valid reason for that, but the water could not go feed into the catch basins. Mm -hmm. So I had to go somewhere, hit the low point, down the slope, under 141, because that's how it's designed, and then went into the pond owned by the private property owner. <clears throat> so just setting the stage like that, I went up to the site, I saw what was going on, I've been up into the pond many, uh, up to his house half dozen times anyhow, uh, up to Overlook Drive probably three or four times, just on my own, and just observed what was, what was happening. So, and I'm going to conclude this way, because, and, and you know I've said this many, many times, we're not the U.S. Senate, okay? So how many times have I said that? More than a lot. So all we want to do is try to get to perspective from conservation. Just so you know, conservation contracted with a private vendor to do, uh, called Mass West, to do the construction, to cut the trees down and doing the work for, for the pathway mm -hmm. up to Scott's Tower. Something caused this, and I don't think it's water runoff from Route 91 or water runoff from somewhere else. There's, there's a certain logic to how water goes, but basically it's low point and it's, gonna, it's just gonna hit the low point. So let me conclude this way. Um, I'm hopeful that there's an insurance policy with the, between the city of Holyoke and Mass West. I'm also hopeful that in the insurance policy, the city of Holyoke is named as an additional insured. It's nice to put in a contract, we'll indemnify you and we'll hold you harmless. You know, lawyers use that all the time. Well, what does that mean? Well, it makes you feel good, I guess, but I'd much rather have an insurance policy by you know, a real insurance company that says, we will insure if something goes haywire, and that way, that way we're covered. Last point is, I realize, and we all realize, this is not a public hearing, but we've invited conservation and Mr. Wamsley, whom I've known from other areas, to be highly respected. He's a Kestrel Land Trust. He is a clear advocate for this area, no question about it. But there are members of the public who would, who would like, including our former uh, city solicitor, mm -hmm. who, who would like to address the body. So I'm hoping when it, when it gets to that point, after you heard from the powers that be, that you'll suspend necessary rules and allow the public to speak for a couple, four minutes, whatever it is, you know, not mm -hmm. to, you know, just to leave it there, and then you can get the, the real world perspective uh, from their take. I'd and, make a motion to suspend the rules and let the public speak if, whenever they're ready to speak. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 That's uh, my story. Thank you. I just have a, um, before, I had actually a question for you, Councillor Bartley, before you <laughs> run away. You <laughs> Sorry, since this is your order and Councillor Sullivan's. Um, are you looking for answers or just an update? Are you looking, you know, what are you, what's your ask? Very fair question. So it's not me, it's, it's the property owners. Okay. So we want to find out, and I'm, I'm using that loosely, mm -hmm. but we want to find out who did what from the city's perspective and how did this occur? So in other words, we cleared the trees. What's the city's take on how the water is changing the acidity and all that and the look of the pond? How, how, did, it, how did the pond change? Who's responsible for it? Somebody's, I mean, it, it changed. I mean, it's, it's night and day. And, and there's pictures if I had, you know, I don't have to, you know, I, don't, I don't live there, but it's night and day. And on top of that, there's now invasive species. For example, copperhead snakes that are now funneled their way into a pond, which they, they'd never been there before, and the property owner's been there, I'm, I'm gonna say a little south of 20 years. Mm -hmm. So um, so he's got, he, he and his wife, or his friend, or friend, they have extensive experience looking at the pond. So if we could do something here, again, you, you, we can't dictate, but we, we just wanna take in the information, hear what they have to say, and you know, if we can come to an accommodation, but at least we can, the public can talk to, you know, Jeff's been around for now at least a dozen years doing this. Um, Yoni's been here a while. Mr. Wamsley's, you know, a you know, major veteran with all this. 
So Attorney Glanville is, um, is, is one of the abutters. It, 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 he's got extensive experience in this room. He'll, he'll know what to say. And then um, maybe yeah. the worst case scenario is they can start talking and figure it out. But at least we, the public, needs to understand from the city's perspective what's going on up there. We haven't even had an update at the Scotts Tower. We haven't had one update presented to us. Right. So maybe, okay. maybe we can at least get that. And now we then figure out what happened with the water runoff. Perfect. Who'd like to speak first? <laughs> Thank you. Just uh, state your name and address. So you know we know. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. I'm Dan Glanville, and I live at 33 Dixie Lane. Uh, so I have some photographs. I'll, I'll share those with the folks. And what they basically demonstrate is the water coming down the hill. They also show some of the uh, remediation work that was done in the area that is unprotected. And then they show some of the action in the pond uh, at the time of the discoloration, just to demonstrate what that was. I didn't take those, but uh, they were provided to me. Um, I do appreciate the time tonight. I know you're all really busy and you have a full agenda, so I'll go very quickly. Uh, we actually live at 33 Dixie Lane, and most people associate this with the pond as you turn into Lindor Heights. But if you take an aerial view, that pond actually goes through behind the entire neighborhood and uh, actually converts into three ponds and actually finishes as a vernal pool in an area next to my property, adjacent to uh, our property. And just as the commission and members of the commission is speaking, I'd like them to address a few things if they could. Just what they define as alteration. My recollection, I haven't really looked at the words alteration in dealing with the Conservation Commission in about 26 years, uh, but I did a quick look this afternoon and you know, it's a very broad definition, extremely broad definition that uh, goes under the area of fill, removal, excavation, dredging, sand, gravel, aggregation of materials, changing of pre-existing draining characteristics, flushing, salination distribution, sedimentation patterns, flow patterns, flood storage, retention areas, draining, disturbing, lowering the water level, water table, dumping, keyword here, discharging, filling with any material, uh, erection of building structures of any kind, placing objects or obstructions, whether or not it interferes with the flow of water, and it continues about double of what I just stated. So I'd be interested in the perspective on what alteration means. I'd like to know how uh, the permit uh, might have been granted and what mitigation factors were put into effect at the granting of the permit and what perhaps a clerk of the works might have done through the process oh, to did. verify that the mitigation factors were, uh, were, were, were uh, collaborated with and continue to be collaborated with, with uh, whether a buffer was put in place uh, and whether or not that buffer continues. And then prior to the permit granting, whether or not uh, abutters, of which I believe we would be, uh, were notified because I don't think there was ever a notification to this procedure. And I know how serious in my tenure with the city the issues of the Conservation Commission and the rules of the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection are, and we take those very seriously. So what the impact of those would be. And then also, I, I had the chance to look today at some of the uh, um, DEP uh, issues with regard to the Stormwater Management Handbook, a very detailed issue. And this actually, I think, qualifies under the terms and conditions under those DEP guidelines of stormwater and stormwater management, and what mitigation factors might have been put in place with regard to that. Look, I haven't seen a copperhead. You'll hear me more loudly than you do if I do see one. But uh, <laughs> uh, certainly, there has been a change to the pond. Uh, I can see it with my naked eye. I'm a lawyer by trade, but I, you can see it from the photographs as to uh, what transpired. So I'm sure everyone had good intentions, but ultimately something happened that impacted not only people's private property, but the environmental characteristics and the nature of this area. So uh, I do thank you for the opportunity to address these concerns this evening, and hopefully we'll have an explanation. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, all right. Thank you, Mr. Glanville. Um, I would think, Yoni, are you ready to address the concerns and give us a little update on what's going on? Yes. All right. I did prepare a little PowerPoint presentation. Oh, wonderful. I won't speak so close to the mic. <laughs> Thank you. So, this is great. So I just wanted uh, the request was for an update on the construction 
I wanted to start sort of towards the beginning of the project when it was still coming together. So we started working with Kestrel Land Trust in 2021 um, on efforts to restore Anniversary Hill Park in Scott Tower. It started with the acquisition of 14.1 acres north of the tower, um, which we were able to do by early 2022. And that's also when we started doing extensive community outreach to see what people wanted from the park. The city's talked forever about restoring Scott Tower and the surrounding environment for uh, many decades. So this is an example. This is the survey that we put out. We got about 500 responses from residents. Uh, next slide. Um, we got a lot of interesting responses. Obviously, we want to restore Scott Tower and the other stone structures, but there's also a lot of feedback related to um, making the park more accessible and inviting, uh, especially for wheelchair users, folks with disabilities. So this sort of shaped the beginning stage of the park designs. Next slide. Um, we also did community vision events where people could share their ideas in person and get a tour. Um, we did this in late 2021. Um, it was exciting. Next slide. We had a mood board, guided walk to Scott Tower, conversations. Um, by this point, the city had retained GZA Geo Environmental to do the preliminary site designs for the park and um, yeah, put the work together. Councilor Anderson Burgos was here at this event. Councilor Tallman, I think. Uh, next slide. I'm trying to go quickly, because I know. <laughs> so here's the master plan that we came up with. Um, green areas are general spaces where we thought we could add park amenities, open things up a little bit, add picnic tables and benches. Obviously, the community wanted the park to remain mostly forested in its current state, um, but we also wanted it to be a multi-use park. Um, so one of the key things we had, oh, wait, not quite. So some of the funding sources, Land and Water Conservation Fund and park grants, um, have a stipulation that all overhead utilities must be buried. I swear I'm going to get to the point of all this. But that sort of dictated what the first step of our project needed to be, because there are um, a number of poles coming all the way from the entrance to community field all the way up to the cell phone tower uh, in the park. So we had to address that. Uh, next slide. So that sort of shaped the phase one with the funding that we were able to get from Land and Water Conservation Fund, Community Development Block Grants, uh, Mass Trails Grants, CPA Funding, and Gateway City Parks Grant. Um, so we did have a series of community updates. Um, these were advertised by flyers in prominent locations on the city website, on social media. We also went door to door to neighbors in the Jarvis Heights neighborhood who are directly adjacent to the park and invited them to come to these events um, where we could share the, we had the preliminary planning process. We created a phase one site plan and then we're giving this back to the community. So those were two of those events. And then next slide. Then we had one last big one at the Holyoke Senior Center. Um, and that's me um, late last year giving that similar update to what you got just now. So that's sort of how we came to this point and where the present project came from. If anyone was on the city council during the 2022 community development block, ground, block grant round, um, you were definitely aware of this project. You saw a schematic of the site plan, not in full detail, but it showed this corridor in the north part of the park being cleared for an access pathway and utility trench that would bring the utilities for Verizon, Comcast, and HG&E um, underground from the shortest point to the north instead of from community field. Next slide. 
Oh, we also had a press release before the work began on the city website. It was covered in the Hampshire Daily Gazette. Mass Live carried it, WWLP. Um, next slide. All right, I finally got to the site plans and the project. So I don't know how well you can see, but there's Overlook Drive on the right. Um, you can see the spotted um, access pathway, and there's kind of a dotted line next to it. That's the utility trench. So um, these are the site plans that we presented to the community. Uh, they were developed by GCA Geo Environmental, um, who the city then retained to also stay on as the engineer of record and oversee all the project activities. So all the site plans, erosion and sedimentation controls, um, designed by GCA. They helped oversee the project and inspected them on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, what else was I going to say about that? But that's, this is the, the project site. But in order to make the best of the situation, we know that relocating utilities underground isn't like fun and exciting. We want to see park improvements. Um, we're also thinking about ways since there needs to be an access pathway for you know, the utilities to access and inspect their underground utilities. Um, we're also treating this as a place for pedestrian access and made sure that it would be wheelchair and ADA accessible. Um, and the site plans also include lots of stormwater controls. There's a trench alongside the trail. There's catch basins that we found on site that actually were pre-existing. Um, and they carry stormwater laterally down the hill. Our contractor was able to get those running again. So that long stretch no longer even drains all the way to Overlook Drive. Um, the project was still ongoing when the sedimentation event happened, but that's one measure that we've taken um, since then. Um, yeah, I think next slide. So now I have a series of photos that I took of the site yesterday. There was a request for a construction update, but I'm hoping to also talk about the stormwater measures and concerns. So this is facing Overlook Drive, facing south. Um, you can see the straw wattles. There's some curbing around the edge of Overlook Drive. And there's actually an armored chute that goes down the hill from there for when Overlook Drive does overflow. So there was pre-existing infrastructure for that. Um, um, next slide. There's a catch basin at the base of the access pathway. There's um, the contractor cleaned it out. We actually have replaced it with a deep sump catch basin. Um, but you can see it's protected by crushed stone and straw wattles. Um, and the second picture on the right shows there's kind of a U-shape around Overlook Drive where a lot of stormwater flows down. Um, in order to mitigate and capture some of that flow, um, we put all this crushed uh, riprap stone that'll slow down the water and allow it to infiltrate. Sure. OK. Sure. Did you have a question, Councilor Sullivan? I just had a question. Um, the black, is it a tarp or something that's mm -hmm. there? What is that used for? Do you want to? Commissioner Devine, that, that's a filter cloth, and it, it's meant to filter out sediment before it gets to the, to the actual sump. And, oh, and okay. that area around the sump is meant to also filter out the sediments before they, they allow the water to pass through, okay. but the sediments are filtered out. And I think when um, when Councillor Bartley was referring to those sumps being covered up, I think it was covered by filter cloth and okay. not actually by, uh, but I, I'm not sure what he's referring okay. to. And again, and the sumps, not all the sumps were in full working order initially because they weren't even known. We okay. didn't have, I don't think we had full knowledge of where everyone was located. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And in the previous uh, photo, the, the pictures you just took the other day, but when, when was that stuff? In, when was the, when were those wattles and barriers installed? 
So they were uh, installed early on the project, but after the siltation event, we added additional controls. You can see another layer behind it. Um, so yeah. in effect, they're redirecting the water in a different direction. Well, it allows the water to pile a little higher. Um, that's still like the tip. That's still the point where water would overflow down to the armored chute to 141. Um, Mm -hmm. Okay, next slide, and then next slide. So this is looking up the access pathway. You can see, so on the left side of the f left picture, there's the utility trench. It's pretty much completed. The only exposed area is uh, near the entrance. That's where we're waiting for the pull license. Once the pull is there, we can that's going to carry the lines um, to the site where they can be put underground at the beginning of the utility trench. Um, you can see, so this is, you know, more recent. This was a dirt road at the beginning of the project. Um, we always had straw wattles. Um, after the siltation event, um, we were trying to figure out ways to improve the site even more. Um, we added compost check dams, but at this stage of the construction, the crushed stone pathway is pretty much complete. Sorry, I'm trying to get the right distance. <laughs> um, but you can see faintly on the left side that the utility trench has been loomed and seeded, um, and that's starting to come in. And on the right side, you can see some of the hand holes. So those are places where the utilities will be able to access their lines if they need to do maintenance since it's mostly buried. Uh, next slide. So now we're continuing up the access pathway. Here's one of those catch basins I was talking about that was pre-existing on the site so that some of it can travel laterally across. This might have been what Councillor Bartley was referring to, that we put drop inlet protection filters in place. There's also an existing catch basin that I don't have a picture of in overlook drive that has one too. So even if sediment was coming down the hill to these locations, there shouldn't have been anything coming through. Um, so we're still not exactly sure what happened. Um, next slide. So here's a fork where you can take a turn and go to Scott Tower. There's a few different access points to go there. Uh, planted some new trees. Again, it's going to stay mostly forested as a park, but it's a little more open and inviting um, and definitely more accessible for wheelchair users. Um, next slide. You can also see the drainage trenches. So those run along the accessible trail in all locations. So stormwater is leaving the trail and infiltrating there throughout, um, even before it gets to the main entrance access pathway. Uh, next slide. Um, there's some bump outs. We're going to put some benches for people to rest. Um, be cool to get some picnic tables going, perhaps in a later phase. Next slide. Here's that big existing parking area. I think when the swimming pool is active, this is where people park to access it. But that the accessible trail even continues from there, so you can get to Scott Tower. Next slide. Um, you can see erosion controls in this area too. That flows down the hill towards um, the regular way you get up to Scott Tower from Community Field, which is still going to be the main access point. Next slide. Continuing up at an accessible grade, you can see a stormwater feature there as well. Um, next slide. It's, it's twisty and curvy because they were trying to find the gentlest grade to approach. So that's why it looks like that. Oh, and you can make it to Scott Tower and hang out there. It's great. Uh, next slide. There. So I think there'll be one more bench there right as you approach. Um, 
So that's phase one uh, of the project. Um, I can speak to a few other questions and then maybe it'll become more of a conversation. So as far as permits for this project, um, the contractor and the city had to get uh, construction general permits from the EPA um, for stormwater discharge. Um, these were acquired um, just because of the nature of the work, the fact that it's not directly adjacent to any wetland resource areas. It's not an area as listed for natural heritage and endangered species by the state of Massachusetts, Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Um, there was no site plan review required because it didn't meet the standards. There was no addition and impervious surface, um, so no stormwater permit. So the construction from the city, so the construction general permit for the activities um, from EPA is what um, was gotten. Um, yeah. So. Thanks, Yoni. Um, did you want to add something, Jeff? Yeah, I did, did just want to add that most of those, the existing trails, were ex they were existing trails, mm -hmm. correct? So, so, they so there's were, no construction. They were daylight. No. There, there was absolutely construction, but it was not, they didn't completely create new roads. In fact, we probably wouldn't have located, you know, you, you could see the slope was a pretty long slope and, you know, pretty much uphill. We, you probably wouldn't build that the same way now. You probably would follow the contour a little more, as they tried to do where they had room to do that. But they did build the, the additional swales and create better drainage. But they didn't, all that area wasn't built. Those, those, there were gravel roads that existed there already. They just daylighted lighted them back and, and created the drainage area for those, those ponds. And I, and I do think that you know, there it does appear there was an issue at at these ponds. We did we met our, our conservation commission members of our commission met with some of some of the neighbors on mo this past Monday. We we met with Raymond Ahern and and she, and I, I think it was Carrie uh, Dunball. Jeff, make so sure they, make sure you speak to the mic. I'm sorry, sorry. right? No, it's okay. Uh, yeah, thank you, <laughs> Councillor. Um, so at any rate, we met with. With them, and we and we looked at the pond, and in fact, uh, before I was at the commission, uh, F Kevin Flynn, who I believe owns um, mm -hmm. the house that Lindor Hides yeah. there, and has been, you know, concerned, he had come to our commission before, before I was on the commission, and asked for uh, remediation that help with with the pond because it was complete. There was out. It was covered with algae and duckweed at that time. At that time, our commission was not very willing to help from what I understand. But I do think, um, you know, I, I think we need to look at those ponds and, and think about how we might be able to help the situation. Because as I looked at, when I moved to Holyoke, we actually looked at that house and I did a little bit of homework to look at those ponds and it appeared to me at that time that all of Lindor Heights, much of 141, and much of the entrance way to, to I-91, to I all drains to those ponds. So they're basically sediment ponds to those areas. I'm not saying that, you know, I do think there was certainly some issues caused by the construction, but there's more, there are more issues than just that construction uh, to those ponds. And those ponds oftentimes have, are completely covered by duckweed and completely covered by algae, and so because because there's no place else for that, for the water and those sediments coming off um, 141 and, and those roads. Again, you can see clearly from Mr. Glanville's pictures that there was a flush of sediment that came into the pond, and mm -hmm. and it's also important to note that March was a, a record wet month. Mm -hmm. uh, so those things again. We had people from um, DEP come out from the state, and they felt like the, the site, everything was properly done on site, but that's not to say that things did not occur. We believe 
And in fact, the GZA instruct uh, engineer of record, they were out there every day checking those, those devices. So we feel like that was functioning, but I do believe it was still likely there were still problems, and I think there probably was sediment and, and a flush of water, but that's, and it clearly impacted those ponds. But I don't think that's the, I don't think that's the whole picture. I think, you know, I think there's a lot of impact to those ponds. And I think, as a commission, I think we have to look at how we can help those, those folks. But even dredging those ponds, they're just gonna, they're gonna sediment up again, because they, it's the whole water, that whole water, so all of Lindor Heights drains to those, to those ponds. And, and 141, a portion. Thank you. Is he down there? Yeah, he doesn't have his hand up, but um, I'd like to mention that we're joined by Councilor Israel Rivera online. Um, do we have any? Um, Councilor McGrath Smith. Um, thank you for joining us today and helping us talk through this um, issue and I think that um, one of my questions is around, there's a difference to your point around doing everything to the letter uh, in terms of what the regulations require and us uh, being forward thinking, knowing how things are changing. Uh, we're not used to planning for so many severe rain events when the ground is still frozen. What does it look like for us to go above and beyond the letter of the law moving forward? Because this was not the only issue that was caused by... In, in that month, we had a number of Ward 7 issues, and I'm sure we did across the city as well. The Ward 7 ones are just the ones that I am most familiar with. Uh, we had culverts that burst. We had ice dams that were formed that were never formed where they were that caused big issues and damage to people's properties. We had this issue. And they all seemed to happen, right? Just within a few weeks of each other when the ground was frozen and we had a lot of in intense rain. So given that we could see that happen again in the future, um, you know, how can we respond to that um, at the city level in the way that we you know, work with our, um, you know, the way we develop contracts in the way that we work with the uh, people on site, the way the Conservation Commission has oversight of a project, just knowing that moving forward so that we can be more forward thinking beyond what the letter of, of the law is requiring. Um, and then also just what potential solutions does the Conservation Commission um, consider here? I know I've heard that dredging the ponds may not work um, for a variety of reasons. So I guess, you know, in this case, it, something needs, I, I would love to see something done to respond. So then what can be done? What possible solutions can the Conservation Commission work with, you know, the folks of Linder Heights in order to, to do something here? Thank you, Councillor. Jeff, Yoni. Can I whoever. respond just briefly? Yes, of course. So, I mean, we've talked about this a little bit um, among ourselves. And so we're very much willing to look into what the options might be. I, I don't think any of us know right now, you know, what, how to solve the, the issue there. People mentioned aerators, I, uh, so we'll, we'll, we can look at options. Okay. Yep. Yep. Councilor Sullivan. So just a few comments or observations here. Number one is uh, I, I was hearing from Kevin Flynn for months before any March event that this was going on long before that so uh, you know I, I want to be clear about that that whatever has gone up there uh, whether it was um, GTA not quite understanding you know or, or improper design on their part I wouldn't fault the contractor contractors just following the plans that are given them to them you know by the LSP so um, uh, you know that that may be uh, something you'll want to look into is you know what was there some fault in in the uh, initial planning that uh, GTA did in the layout that, that affected the flow of there I mean it's it's pretty obvious I think to, to most of us there there was a significant impact on that pond uh, the, the pond has we're talking about dredging it now but it's something that has never been needed to be dredged before. So once again, it's, it's something 
more current, more recent that's going on that's uh, affecting this. Um, uh, I, I don't like the the, um, the the thought of uh, just leaving the neighbors and the butters up there hanging. I, I think we need uh, it's clearly all the intentions are every, everything is very well intentioned as far as what's going on around Scotts Tower. I think we've got great community support. If we have an unforeseen consequence, we really ought to do something uh, to address it for for the neighbors that have been uh, inadvertent inadvertently affected by this. Mm -hmm. so. Thank you, Councilor. Any other questions? Um, I would just ask um, if if something is to be done, is there a timeline that's reasonable for some research? or ideas that could be shared with the public in a reasonable amount of time? And what is that? What is a reasonable amount of time? Um, I guess this would be to any conservation people in the room. Um, that's a good question. I mean, I think to Jeff's point earlier, thinking about solutions needs to be bigger than this project. Mm. Um, you know, there's five separate drains from 141 that go into the pond. Um, Jeff might have misspoken the date. The siltation event, when I became aware of, was on December 19th. That's when we visited the site with DEP and they inspected the erosion controls and we came up with additional measures to go above and beyond and ensure there weren't issues. Um, but the fact is we're going to keep getting heavy rain events. Um, there's always runoff from these roads even when it's not perceptible, pollutants, sediments. One of the photos actually that the residents brought shows the drainage swale from 141. This was something that I noticed on the date of the sedimentation event is that actually a lot of the turbid water um, was joining the site from farther up East Hampton Road coming down. Mm -hmm. So I'm not ruling out that our site didn't contribute, but I don't think it was the only uh, um, contributing factor during that event. Um, so these were probably designed my understanding is that 141 was constructed in the early 60s along with I-91. Mm -hmm. I think the water just goes directly from the road and streets like Overlook Drive into the ponds. I think that looking into a deeper solution for reducing inputs needs to involve um, state partners and look at ways to improve those systems or find other places for the water to go. Um, I think that's the bigger project. Um, as far as remediation to the pond, I'm not sure. You know, I'm dredging. I know that an aerator was recommend was something that I think the resident, as Jeff mentioned, it was before our time. But there are devices that I understand are. There's one in use in East Hampton in the main pond that's in town. It can sort of aerate the water and introduce oxygen that might counteract the algal, you know, presence. Um, but those are speculative solutions. I think it's um, a tough site. But this timeline, I, <laughs> Thanks, I wasn't you. prepared to answer that question. Yeah. Answer Sullivan. Well, I'll, I'll make a suggestion there in just a mm -hmm. second. As, as far as any runoff, uh, if, if that section of 141 was designed in 1960, there hasn't been an event like this then in 64, 63 years. All right. So I, I don't uh, quite understand uh, why, why all of a sudden now the, the runoff from 141 is a root cause of it, unless. Once again, something further upstream is causing more flow down into 141 area. But all, all that aside, we, I, I think we've got a, uh, a community problem uh, mm -hmm. that we ought to addr address together. Um, maybe we should leave this tabled, uh, give the Conservation Commission a chance, um, 
some of the rest of the city officials, the mayor, uh, DPW, whoever else needs to get involved, uh, maybe the state, Kestrel, whatever, um, and leave this tabled for uh, a few months. We don't, I don't think we have to put a timeline on that right now. Um, I just... I know on a public hearing we do, but right, right now we can just table it. And uh, yeah. I think if uh, in, in order the amount of time goes by, you'll hear from us again. <laughs> but it'd be nice if they came back. We could take it off the table, say within 90 days or so. Right. Yeah, I actually, um, thank you, Councillor Sullivan. I actually made a note here that we revisit this in the fall, possibly. Um, I know Councillor Devine had a question. Yeah, just more of a comment. Okay. Um, I, I definitely agree with what Councilor um, Sullivan's saying, but for those of you who aren't as old as I am, um, I remember as a child, Dr. Yell uh, was the owner of that home, and I think Stephen Flynn is only the second owner in all this time, and so it was definitely something that happened. I hate to use the word recently, but it certainly wasn't when we were growing up. It was a beautiful piece of property, a beautiful pond. I think they had a boat that, uh, you know, a rowboat that they went out in. Um, so as long as the neighbors are kind of okay with us waiting for a few months, okay, that's a good idea. All right. That sounds good. So are we happy to table this and, and then invite you all back in for some ideas in... October. October. I believe Mike made that motion, right? <laughs> you made the motion. So I Respect it. Respectfully, yes. But we, but item seven is somewhat related. For, um, oh, the Verizon. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's to close up the one existing yeah. trench that is. Thank you. Good Thank you very you. much. Yeah. Good seeing you guys. Okay, so. I think we'll. That's to be able to close up the one trench that's there. That's mm -hmm. that we. That's open. Right now on right. that. So we're gonna we address can report that. back as part of that. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna we can um, address that separate order. I, um, but I think it's important for you know for those neighbors there to know that we're gonna um, continue this discussion and address their concerns. So, any other comments, questions, funny looks? Nope. No, just me. Nope. Okay. Um, all right. So you have a favor. motion to table. Yep. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thanks. All right, so I'll table that and invite you guys back in for that. Motion to take up item number seven. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Item seven is ordered that the city council approve a license agreement between the city of Holyoke and Verizon for relocation of cables at Anniversary Hill Park. The project located at, or project located at Scott Tower Road in Holyoke, Mass. And I believe we got the, um, the legal um, license info from our attorney's office yep has everyone had a chance to read it yep. excellent um let's see who so this petition was by me oh lucky me um so it's my understanding that this uh license is needed in order to complete the um the wiring work at Scott's Tower and continue the project? Is that correct, Yoni? That's correct. And uh, Vin, Vincent is here from HGNE on Zoom. Oh, and he great. can speak to the technical aspects. Okay. All right, great. Thank you, um, Vincent. Thank you. Would you please enlighten us? Um, hi, this is uh, Vincent O'Connell, uh, Polio Gas and Electric, 99 Suffolk Street, Polio Mass. I work in the engineering department. Uh, we're working uh, with the city, uh, Scotts Tower redevelopment. Uh, the poles and structures, as you guys have stated earlier, on Scotts Tower Road are gonna be converted to underground facilities. Uh, in order to do that, there's gonna be some uh, additional uh, utility work off of East Hampton Road up to Anniversary Hill Road. Uh, that's going to require a single pole set at the top uh, in order to get the facilities uh, into that location and then uh, transfer them underground. Thank you very much. Um, would you like to speak on this at any further, Yoni? 
Uh, no, that's pretty much okay. uh, what it is. Any One poem. But by doing this, we get to remove like 25 poles farther down in the park. Oh, nice. Oh, so it'll be beautiful. Any uh, questions from committee members? They're, they're not going to exasperate any water flows, I take it? <laughs> Councilor <laughs> Sullivan. <laughs> we don't think so. <laughs> Uh, yep. Anyone else? Okay. Uh, mo motion is to approve the license agreement. Second. All in favor? Aye. All right. We'll send this with a uh, recommendation to approve to the Folk City Council. Thank you so much for coming in. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'd like to make a motion to take up item number five, unless somebody has objections. Please. We'll, we'll please take them as a package, five yeah, and Yeah, five and nine. nines. Right? Five, five and six. Five and, five and six. six, sorry. All in favor? Aye. All right. So I would like to welcome the wonderful MIFA team in to, to speak. Thanks for your patience. You're welcome to come in, have a seat anywhere with a mic. We always save the best to last. That's right. <laughs> Thank you. Do you want to stand up or you want to come and have a seat? Done. Done. You can sit. Oh, come on in. Okay. <laughs> It's been a long day, I know. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Welcome to the stage. Anywhere you like, yep. And the microphones work just by pushing the button in the middle. You'll see a green light come on, and you can uh, just speak into the mic when you do. All right. So items five and six are um, from David Weinberg, communication regarding Victory Theater, and six is the MIFA response to Mr. Weinberg's letter and addendum. So thanks so much for joining us. Um, I understand you have a presentation, and you're going to give us all kinds of lovely updates about what you're doing in Holyoke. Any popcorn or anything? Yeah. You didn't bring us any popcorn? Popcorn? 50 year old. 50 year old popcorn. <laughs> Stale a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, are you, if you're all going to speak, if you could just introduce yourself briefly, um, that would be helpful for the public. Is your microphone on, Don? Uh, ah. Ah. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, I'm Don Sanders, Donald T. Sanders, and I'm the Executive Artistic Director of MIFA, the Massachusetts International Festival of the Arts Victory Theater. Woo. Delighted to be here, and thank you for all the time you put into the city. Thank you. I'm Brad Foster. I do accounting for MIFA. All right. I'm Susan Palmer. I'm the project manager for the Victory Theater. I don't have a mic, but I will speak loudly. My name is... <laughs> My name is Matt Jacobs, and I work for Bar and Bar Builders. We're the construction management firm that's going to be renovating the theater. Nice. My name is Fleur Kuda. I'm the administrative assistant at MIFA. Hmm. Do we have some right, people online? Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure. Let me check. I don't see anyone. Um, Jeffrey, do you see anyone online as part of this item? Not that I'm aware of. Okay, thank you. All right, you have the floor. Thank you. <clears throat> well, uh, first of all, again, we're very happy to be here. We're always happy to illuminate the public and even ourselves by illuminating the public about this particular project. Mm -hmm. um, we uh, responded to uh, Mr. Weinberg's letter a point by point, and uh, we have uh, folks here who can uh, answer any questions. Uh, we would love to uh, keep the dialogue going about anything that is confusing to people about the theater. It's a very, very special project. And uh, uh, so that's the spirit in which uh, we engaged in responding to uh, Mr. Weinberg. And uh, we also have a presentation, which we'd love to ask your permission to show, which I think will orient you to the, uh, the current status of the project, which will enable perhaps everything, questions that are uh, uh, there, enable them to be brought forward and we can um, discuss them, address them. All right, so, thank you. Without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Susan Palmer to make the presentation. 
Thank you, Don. This is working right, I guess. Okay. Yeah, the green light is on. Thank you. Um, so, as Don said, we we um, were in receipt of the um, communication from Mr. Weinberg, and we have provided a point by point um, response to the. Um, assertions in his document and we're happy to discuss any of those in detail if you'd like to do that but we our observation was much of the content of that letter or that communication was outdated very old or had incorrect interpretations of information so we thought the best way to proceed here would be to, to tell you what's going on right now and I will tell you it changes every day as a matter of fact Madam Chairman, we submitted this this presentation to you two days ago, and it has since changed for the better um, <laughs> in our favor. This afternoon. To the tune of $3 million. <laughs> so every day th things change in the project. I'll just walk you through this, and we'll be happy to answer any questions along the way. Um, this is just a little overview of what we've been doing very recently, and it's a schedule that has been put together by our architects. It shows what we did starting on March 8th and, and going all the way through to our plans for August 30th when we expected to have 100% construction documents completed. We are in fact ahead of schedule and we've been told by our architects that we should have them by the end of July. So that just accelerates the entire process up by 30 days. And we, we do have uh, Matt here, who is not a part of the architectural team, but he is leading the construction team. So any questions about that, he'd be able to answer. But we are on target or ahead of target with what we're doing on this right now. Th uh, this is, again, we just wanted you to see, we've been hearing from people, geez, nothing is going on there. And as a matter, and, and Mr. Weinberg's assertion was nothing was going on there. And as a matter of fact, a lot of things were going on. We had people on the roof, and we had people inside. And since he had no access to either area, he didn't know things were going on. He assumed nothing was going on. But this is, we don't expect you to read this. We can explain it point by point if you wanted it explained. But we just wanted you to see the level of detail and the amount of work that's been going on sequentially since the beginning of March. And here's some pictures that just show what's been going on in the interior. So we've had heavy machinery in there. And we've had people climbing all over there like monkeys. I mean, they've been up and down the walls. They've been on the ceiling. They've been on the roof. I don't know, Matt, if you want to talk a little bit about what you guys have been doing in there? Yeah, for the past three months, the... Sorry. <laughs> I've probably got to talk quieter now. Um, so for the past three months or so, uh, you know, the main focus has been giving direction to the design team um, as far as, you know, what specifically needs to be addressed in the theater, right? Because it hasn't been touched in a very long time. So we need to open up some areas. We need to give them access to the structural members. We need them to get in there and, and see sort of what condition the building is so they can finish their documents. And that's been a big part of what we've been doing over the past few months, as well as trying to mitigate some of the water infiltration that we've been getting because that's deteriorating the building. And that was a, a main thing is stopping the water from getting in and stopping the deterioration of the building. Um, and I think we've done a good job. We spent uh, a lot of time and money up on the roof, uh, temping in areas that were causing the water infiltration, as well as fixing some drains inside the building that were leaking, um, and also opening up areas for investigation purposes for the structural engineer and the architect. Yeah. So this next slide here was prepared by Bar and Bar and. and um, Matt's group, and this is page one of a 10-page document that shows you precisely day by day, month by month, how this, this timing and the scheduling for all of the activity that will take place in the theater, how detailed it actually is and how much of a process it is and how much discipline there is um, imposed on the process of getting this work done. This is typical of the kinds of work that happens in these kinds of jobs, and I do this stuff all over the country. This is one job that I've got going on right now. I'm also working in Newport, Rhode Island. I'm city of my birth. I, well, lucky you. What? And you moved. What? <laughs> my father was in the Navy, so I didn't really understand. Okay. Well, it's a beautiful city, and they have a beautiful theater. I'm also working in upstate New York and Texas and um, in a couple of other places. And I can tell you, this is how this stuff goes, and it takes a long time. And in every community that I've worked in, people will say, why does this take so long? And the answer is because there is no built-in affinity group. 
No one has bought a ticket for this theater in over 40 years. This is not like the hospital that's doing a rehab that saved your grandmother's life. This is not your college where you got your degree or your church that you're supporting. We don't have any of that. We are building from the ground up, and that's just the way that these things go. So this is the beginning of it, and this is the way we will work our way through. We have um, decided that in addition to the fundraising that we've been doing and securing government funds, that we would secure investment uh, financing to get the thing going. A lot of the money that we have secured is, <coughs> excuse me, what we call reimbursable money. So, for example, the historic and state um, tax credits, federal and state um, historic tax credits are reimbursable. That means we don't get them until the theater opens. So we have to borrow against those. And those that's that's significant amount of money. When we they, when they were first granted to us, they had a value assessed of, at about twelve million dollars. As the cost of the project goes up, the value of the tax credits go up, and we think they're worth about. And we're we're estimating now. We think they're worth about nineteen million. We count about seventeen million of that because we'd like to be conservative in the way that we are talking about the funds that have been accumulated. But meanwhile, we have gone out into the markets to identify um, in investment from private equity into the project. And we were told probably four weeks ago that there is an investor group ready to come to the table. It is Axos Bank, and this is being, being facilitated by Stiefel Investment Bank out of St. Louis. They told us that they had identified investors that are going to come to the table with $17 million. Today, well last night, after working hours, we got their term sheet and they are willing to come to the table for, tw not, not only this, they're not only willing to come to the table with $22 million, $5 million more than we were talking about, they are also willing to talk to other investors in the state and other private loan investment people um, to join them in the investment fund to bring the, the final monies that we need to the table to uh, accumulate what we need to go to contract with him. <laughs> so that was great news for us. We've been sort of celebrating all day in between working that we've, we've gotten, we've lined this up. And we were with the mayor two days ago and he said, well, when are you going to know about this $17 million? And I said, well, we're going to know about it when they're ready to tell us about it because <laughs> it's their money. Yeah. Within the 10 hours of him saying that, we not only knew about the 17, but we knew that it was going to be closer to 22. That's great. So this is, again, a table that I don't expect you to be able to read from where you're sitting. We can forward this information to you. But this just outlines what we call, it's typical in our projects to, to put together what we call a sources and uses table. So we have on the top what the uses are. And right now, we are looking at an overall price of about a little bit more than $71 million. If you look at the bottom line of the um, sources, we have identified $78 million, which includes the $17 million from Access Bank, which is now 22, about $22 million. Um, some of that is debt, so it will have to be repaid. This is not all contributed revenue. But in terms of have we identified enough money to get the job done, we have. And that's where we are with that. Great. Short and sweet. <laughs> and we would love to entertain questions. I just, um, it's great. And I've, I've worked with your group before when we were in the, the room over there when you first, not first began, but um, it's, it's thrilling that every time I hear you guys, it gets better and better and better. So that's great. But there's people out there that don't know what we know. And I'm wondering if you might utilize, if you haven't done it already, Holyoke Media to put on a presentation down there. You know? Well, not only is that a good idea, it's so good that we've been doing it. We did a presentation really? there, what, 10 days ago? Yes. So, yeah, we had, um, we were in the- You should the, advertise that. Well, it was in the newspaper. Which newspaper? Well, I, you're gonna have to say, I don't okay. live here. So go ahead, T you talk about how that was publicized. Um, well, I mean, here, let me preface this with, I love this idea, the, 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 the important thing here I mean, even look, I live with these figures every day and these charts, and they're very hard <laughs> to look at yeah. and have 
be they, they're very hard to get them humanized without somebody talking them through. Yeah. And 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 it's also very hard um, for for people to understand the scope of this kind of project. And I I, I hope you don't mind if I use the ponds that we just heard about. <laughs> I, I got very moved by the fact of these ponds that are here that are part of our community. Mm -hmm. They're part of our geography. The Victory Theater is like that pond. It, it, it's sort of its own thing. Okay, it's been built. You know, it was, a, it was designed as a live theater. It became a movie theater. Even today, we were having lunch at Fame, and somebody stopped me and said, I went there with my grandmother. I can't tell you how Aww. often that happens to me. Oh, sure. It's, it's a thing, and it's, it's, it's alive, but it's not alive. You know, it's dormant. And how the, the fact that people want it back, I want it back. I yeah. want it back because I want the personal joy of seeing things that I know are out there entertaining people in the world and what and we know as an economic development project what it can do. We know that. It's gonna be hard. But getting back to what Susan was talking about, we we have been doing smaller presentations at Holyoke Media. In this case this was part of the Victory Players. And oh, Victory okay. Players put on a production of new uh, Latin classical contemporary music. They come here. This is something that we, that by being together and even together talking this way, we've realized one of our consultants from IMG Associates said, this is, people can't wait for this, you know, because it's going to take a long time. Mm -hmm. And because it's a lot of money. It wouldn't yeah. take a long time if it weren't a lot of money. And and, and, and so we put together this concept of these musicians and, and they're living and they're live and they're playing music and people come, okay, it's a small theater. Yeah. Victory Theater is 1,600 seats. Right. Holyoke Media is 75 seats, okay? But the reason why Susan brought this up is that we use that to be able to talk to people and humanize. It, it's not even so much the programming at the Victory, it's how this thing is emerging here. Out of, I have to go back when I first started this project, I didn't start it, I inherited it because we wanted to use the theater and there was a group called Save the Victory Theater, Helen Casey, a wonderful group of people. They had started on saving the project in the late uh, 1980s. They got to 19, I have to say this because it's important, 1992 and they got a price tag of $9 million and they couldn't raise that money. Yeah. So, so it, this is the constant thing that we're faced with. They couldn't raise $9 million. Then it stayed for about, well, until we took it over in 2005. Um, it stayed dormant, lying there like the pools, the ponds yeah. that, that are there. They're, but it's a part of this agriculture. And um, uh, then when experts came in to say, okay, it's hard to have a theater like this in a community, and uh, Margaret Wood came in from New York who was saved uh, City Center Theater. I brought her in, she said, it's great, it's gotta happen, why? Okay, if there were 14 other theaters like this hanging around us, you know, that had the capacity to be open, maybe that wouldn't make it such an important thing. This is the only one, yes. and it's here. It's in our community, and it can do its thing. It's not gonna do everything that we need, but it can do, do it. It's gonna take a long time, Margaret said. She said it would take 20 years. She told me that in 2005. Yeah. She said, you know, and then, okay, then I got a call from Helen Casey, and she said the city council is convening, and there, there is a, just like, you know, a, there's going to be a, a motion to tear down the Victory Theater. And I, I, she, she said, what can we do about it? And I said, please invite me, <laughs> I'll come. We, di we didn't have all the facts then. I said, if you don't tear it down, I promise you, we will open this theater. I, I did, I said that. I think it's probably, I hope it's on tape. I, yeah. I, I think pretty sure that's what I said. And, and because by that point, we had done enough research to know what it could do. So coming back to these numbers, these numbers reflect classic ways in which money is raised to affect a project like this, particularly, and it, it is designed, the, the, the formula is designed with 
to reflect the capacity of the community. So that's why we had to start with getting a certain amount of individual money, the Demores, some individual donors, so that would show the city that, there, yes, there are people there who will help, then it would show the state, and we could go to the state and say, this is going to be the impact that it'll have, and then we could go to the federal government, because mm -hmm. without that, it, you, you saw the price tag, okay. 71 million bucks. Okay, I mean, that's what it is. And this, what uh, Susan, uh, is talking about Axos and the the um, financing uh, is based on and I can I, country simple honestly I base this on my concept of collateral. The collateral is that we want this. Okay, number one, that's that's the first thing. If nobody wants it. There's no collateral, no matter how much money people have. Okay, the collateral is people want it or enough people who know what it can do want it, and then. Her, Margaret's first thing is that we had to get the recognition of the tax credits of the Massachusetts uh, Historic Commission that this was an important project. They're the toughest ones in the business, and that took us four years. We had to raise money to pay architects, the same architects, Durkee yeah. Brown, who have stuck with us and have carried this thing right straight through. We had to put that in front of them, and they could have come back. We were all sitting around like, I don't know, you know, waiting for the, the word, and uh, Brana Simon, she called up and she said, we're giving you the approval, okay? Mm -hmm. And what that meant was, that began with a million dollars. We've got the copy of the check that uh, Secretary Galvin came and presented it to me, <laughs> okay? Mm -hmm. That million dollars, you know, this is the confusions. We didn't get a million dollars in the bank that we then, you know, <laughs> did stuff with. We, that, what that was is, as Susan is explaining, it means that when the project is done, you get that money. But it is collateral that gives the kinds of right. financing and, and individuals the confidence that somebody's behind there. And as Susan says, that's now up to 17, maybe it's $19 million. Wow. So that when we're out there, having hammered away at this and tested everybody's patience and driven everybody crazy, my family, you, <laughs> myself, okay that there is something there, okay? Mm -hmm. and, and it's very important for the public to know that, but it's very hard to communicate. Mm -hmm. I mean, if I wanna put a new roof on my garage, I can't just go and say, come do the garage roof, and, but we're raising the money, right. you know? <laughs> yeah. But it's, do you understand? it's, I understand why people say, what's going on here? Yeah. But it is a very different way of doing something. The fact is, is that we need as a community to, to see that, that something is being done. We really are yeah. doing something. We're yeah. not doing anything wrong, and I'm not just talking about me for or myself. We're not doing anything wrong by it's taking so long. These things take a long time, and the progress is extraordinary. I mean, it really is extraordinary. Um, when we look at this great presentation, I know I'm taking up the questions thing, but I feel that there are some fundamental issues like that background that always have to be understood and that the money, the, the tax credits are a kind of collateral. They're not gonna go away unless the project goes away. And so we keep building on that and that gave, frankly, the current uh, uh, administration in Boston the confidence, the data that Susan put together that showed what a theater like this opened can do uh, for a community, the economic development part, all of that builds on itself and people gain confidence. So it is an investment in something that is going to happen. And, and each, as, you, as the investment unfolds, and when Susan brought up what we did over the last weekend, I know, that, I mean, to me, when people come out of those musical events after we've talked and they read about the, the program, they say, this is, this is wonderful. <laughs> you know, they say, when's it going to open? Yeah. You know what I mean? So you know, it's it's just it it just we've got to understand that that is the that is the power of this piece, and yeah. we are raising money, and people are giving money. We've had, nobody's ever given a million dollars to Holyoke. We have a donor from Amherst, for God's sake, and they gave us a million bucks. Yeah. And we have the Demores. Okay, they were from Holyoke. They put up one point seven. Five, you know, one hundred, one million yeah. seven hundred fifty thousand dollars. I know, you know, a lot of people. Some people have that kind of money. But that's a lot of money, yeah. okay? Mm -hmm. And it, it, it's, it's because, it's because we're doing something. We're and, here. And the memory, you're there. 
and we're doing something. And, and I don't even mind about David Weinberg. I, yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, I mean, I know people, yeah. but it's not, it's not good to just willfully not get something. But okay, let's put that aside. Yeah. But, uh, but something's happening. It really is happening. Right. Well, and and um, just to be clear, so the public has a little bit of an understanding, if they didn't read all these attachments, um, your presentation and what the questions you're addressing tonight are really in response to a letter that was or received from David Weinberg. He was actually called and messages were left with him twice um, and there was no response. So um, we did try to let him know that you would be here tonight um, to address all the points that you're addressing. Um, and I did want to just clarify too that um, for people who wonder how much Holyoke is paying for this? How much is Holyoke paying for this? How much is they paying for the job altogether, you mean? How much is Holyoke paying for this? For the project. For the yes, ma'am. Okay. We, at this point, we have a $2 million um, commitment from the mayor, which nice. is about 5% of the overall okay. cost. Um, and there, is, there has been um, a commitment by the previous mayor mm -hmm. that some of the uh, fees associated with the, this magnitude of construction would be over forgiven, basically, like the nice. tipping fees and um, utility permits and those kinds of things that cost money. And at that point, they were uh, expected to be valued at about $1.2 million that so the city like could kind. forgive some of that. Mm -hmm. Nice. And also, um, just to be clear, so any funding that has been secured from, from the state um, is not available for use until the project is complete. Correct? No, that's not true. No. Some of it, some well, actually, most of the stuff that has come from the state has um, been made available strictly for project use. Mm -hmm. We have had um, the construction docs paid for through that money. The most recent allocation of three and a half million dollars, we've gotten the first. A uh, million and a half, right? Mm -hmm. And that's gone. If you walk by, you can see there's a lot going on in there. That's going right into the sticks and bricks elements of the building. We expect to close on the second two million, and that that we can spend that. We we are so grateful to the governor because that is the biggest pot of money that we have had allocated to the project that we don't have to finance again. She says, take this money, put it to use. If I like what I see, there's more coming. Nice. Great. All right. Great. But you never answer the question, Don, is where do we advertise our programs? <laughs> you, you, yes, got, you got a little off track. Media. <laughs> They're <different. laughs> they were in the newspaper. I don't know the names of the newspapers. Yes. Well, I, we didn't get to that part. The, the, uh, I mean, you know, just last week, because of the program at the uh, Holyoke Media, we were on Channel 22. The city is on Channel 22 twice. Wow. You know, and not about a shooting or all the right, stuff that right. happens at any city. Don't get me started. You know, yeah. it, 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 they, the, they were so excited about what they saw that they came back again and they did another program. And I get people calling me, I, I, you know, from all, they say, we heard about Holyoke again. You know, right. sounds great. Uh, and then we have a, a, a big article in Berkshire's magazine. Uh, that is coming out. We have some extra copies that I'll send. We should have brought them. Yeah. That it shows the the theater, what it's going to do, what it's um, you know what it looks like when it's open, but it also lists some of the accomplishments that Neath has already made, like the Victory Players. The Victory Players are going to be playing at UMass at the Fine Arts Center in September. Mm -hmm. They've been they have been uh, broadcast by GBH. That's the finest in that realm. That's like the Grammys, you know, I mean, and, and people are hearing about it nationwide. It gives us good air because, anyway, I, I could get started, up, but that's, that's, where, that's where we are getting the word out. I, I do feel, and I feel frustrated about it a little bit. That's why I, I was riffing on uh, the idea of having some sort of public session or something, because I think, I think the nitty gritty of the stuff is so, exotic it's oh, yeah. not like what you know it's just really unusual i mean i i trained to be in this business so to speak of the theater and even for me uh you know it, it's an exotic situation mm -hmm. so i think i think we're always looking for way like we th sometimes think let's have public sessions or open some kind of thing mm -hmm. you know so that's it i think we're probably we had actually planned we're planning to do something like that mm -hmm. uh, given the next phase that finishes over actually after the victory and to do it in the, you know, the oval 
room there, but maybe we should do something sooner. I mean, you know, it, it, we, it's very important that, that people understand yeah. what we're doing because we're good people. <laughs> you are. I know that. Do you have anything? No, I just want to make a few comments. Um, I'm not sure if it was covered. There was a lot covered, but um, for those people that don't know, the Victory Theater um, is listed as a historic building on the National Register of Historic Places. And that's huge to point. This isn't Holyoke. This is our home. We, we owe it to, to, to protect it, in my own personal opinion. Born and raised in Holyoke, yes, I'm going to state my age, over 54 years now. I remember going as a child to that theater. Um, you know, so what I also remember is going and visiting Victory Theater since I've gotten elected. Mm -hmm. I can't even count how many times I've been there inside that building. I know there's a lot of moving parts to this project. This project, it's a difficult project, and there's a lot of moving parts, and the problem with the community is that, or people that don't know, don't know. Yeah. There's, there's that ed educational piece that is missing, right? How do we inform, and sometimes some people just don't wanna listen to that, right? They assume that it's like an on and off switch. You could just turn on the switches and, hey, look it, we have it done. It's much more complex. <laughs> this project is much more complex. There's a lot of people. It's just a building project. Yeah, and, right? <laughs> so how I see it is this way. Like I said, I grew up here. I remember that building when it was open. And now my husband and I, we travel to New York, to Rhode Island, to Boston and to wherever else there's theaters to see pieces of art, what I call moving art. And it inspires and encourages. It's about life, love, you name it, whatever you're into. The, this is what we need in this city because if it's good enough for Boston, if it's good enough for New York, if it's good enough for Rhode Island, well, dang it, it's good enough for Holyoke because we deserve it. We have a piece of that history right down the road. People need to understand that. They need to understand that we deserve it. Mm -hmm. All of us, the entire community. And let's not forget that once this goes online, the connection that it will make to the theater at HCC and the educational purposes behind that. Math. or the theater at Holyoke High School. Mm -hmm. They have a theater program. Think about the bridges that once this goes online that it'll create for this community and not just this community. Let's not forget Chigabee, Springfield, West Springfield, the surrounding cities that'll come here. It's what Holyoke needs like a long time ago. I needed to point that as a, not just as, a, as an elected official, but as a lifetime Holyoke resident, we deserve this. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Councilor Sullivan. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. I was going to show you I'm something, um, Councilman Juan. I, I, you know what? I'm sorry I didn't recognize it's you before. Okay. You know why? Because you're oh, always sweet. with Miss Duffy. Miss Duffy. I mean, I, what do I know? Anyway, um, I'll, I'll say one thing quickly that is, I am always hired, in my, my estimation is a last resort. I come to projects that have been underway where people come to these projects and they work for 10, 15, 20 years without a process. They've never done it before. They don't know what the steps are. It's all passion. I call it seat of the pants. And when they finally run out of ideas and they don't know what to do next, somebody will say, well, why don't we call a professional? And that's, then I come in. But I have never worked on a job that hasn't gone on for more than 10 years. I worked on one job in Mount Vernon, Ohio, that had been going on for 33 years. Wow. And they finally decided to call and get some help. I got called on the job, and I was doing interviews in the community, community um, to just you know, to figure out what was going on there. And I was with a bank CEO, and he said, oh, yeah, I remember my parents working on that when I was in kindergarten. I mean, that is how, this is how long these things yeah. take. The other thing I just want you to know, and I was trying to find my document that speaks to what you just said. I did a user demand study here 
that showed how people in this area within a 30, 60, and 90 minute drive time from this theater are currently spending, these are people who are currently spending their discretionary income on a variety of different variables. And we tested for theater as one of 10 variables. Within the 90 minute drive time, 30, 60, 90, there are 450,000 people who are currently spending their money. I have a map that shows how many people are spending their money in the mapped area around the theater. You don't have a theater. And people are spending their money on the theater. You know what that means? They're getting in their car and they're driving elsewhere. This map also happens to show, because it's within the 90 minutes, what the Berkshires has for a resident population we have probably four times that here. So what's that? that's telling us that the people he, that live here are getting in their cars and they're driving to the Berkshires because it's not the resident population over there that's spending their money on theater, mm -hmm. it's you guys. <laughs> yeah. So you know when this is open, you don't have to drive anymore. <laughs> nice. Councilor Solomon? Yep. No, I, it, it's amazing how long you've stuck with it, but I've got to say the, the Arm and Hammer show was oh. in what year? Oh, God. 1987, yeah. Okay. So we talk about 10, 15, 20-year timelines. We're coming up on 40 years. Yeah. All right? So there's a great deal of skepticism now yeah. in the general public. And um, we're hearing tonight for the first time, now it just the price just went up by another $9 million. The last time we heard it was $63 million. We're hearing tonight for the first time. Now it's 72 million. And this has got to be taken in context with the fact that we have uh, two new developments going on, uh, an 88 unit housing project that's coming in at 60, 55 million. Uh, that's you know, being done with public money. Uh, so it, it all has to be done a prevailing wage, but we also have a private developer now that's doing another 80 units for 25 million. Yeah. So, the, the costs and, and the, the benefit are really getting astronomical. The skepticism in the general public over this timeline is yep. huge it's right real. now. Yeah. And when, when, you, when you talk about the um, discretionary income and the driving elsewhere, there's besides the financial issues, there's the other problems in Hoyoke that are still enormous. We, we still in recent weeks have had shootings, murders, right on the streets, and these people are just, just, unless all these other problems are addressed at the same time, we're putting an awful lot of money and an awful lot of hope into something that has other holistic problems that need to be addressed to make this successful. Mm -hmm. So I think in, in fairness, we, we've got to look at all of this and address these public concerns <coughs> as well. I, I would just like to say two things. Um, number one, you're right, you have those issues here, and they need to be addressed and they deserve to be addressed. The money that is being um, allocated toward these project, the, our project, is never going to go to public housing. This is money that's dedicated it, for this. Me, I, I, I didn't I'll, suggest that. I'm, I'm okay. saying how the public views it and putting it in context with other projects going on around the city. Well, here's the thing. Your mayor and your community, from what I have been told during the interviews that I conducted here, wants to see a transformation of the city of Holyoke. They want to see something with transformational impact. That means you want to attract people who do not live here to come here, people with means to come here and spend their money in your city, and they are not coming if you have really nice low-income housing, that's not going to get them here. They're going to come here and spend their money in your community because you you have something here that they want to participate in. You Do you need very nice low-income housing? Yes, you do. That's not going to transform your city. I'm not suggesting it is. I'm just, suge I'm just mentioning the scope of the product, projects. And the thing that we're not addressing here, right, these people with the discretionary income if we're still picking bodies off the street, needles off the street, right, having drive-by shootings, right, they're not coming here no matter how beautiful a theater we build or how wonderful a play we put on. Well, Councilman Sullivan, I would like to just point you to a project that I worked on in Schenectady, New York, that was in a similar situation. GE pulled out, just like all of your industrial pulled out here. GE pulled out. 
They had tumbleweed rolling down the main streets. They had all empty storefronts. They had $2 stores, both of them closed. The mayor of the city in the late 70s scheduled that theater, Proctor's Theater, in Schenectady, you may have heard of it, for demolition. A group of people came in, community people, they've been looking at that thing sitting there decaying for decades. It, it looked a lot like what you have here. It was built in the same year, actually. And they got used to looking at it like that. And nobody thought about, well, what is, what's going to, why is it, does this matter to us? Finally, when, the, when it was going to be scheduled for demolition, a group of people rose up and said things like, oh, my grandmother had their first date there, and, and on and on and on. The nostalgia was the first thing that saved it. If you go to Schenectady right now, within probably five years of that theater opening, and it opened up in 2005, there had th three new hotels that opened up in the downtown and 11 new restaurants. And that was in three years, and that was 15 years ago, and it's only gotten better. They contribute right now. When they opened up, their annual operating budget was $5 million. Their annual operating budget now is over $20 million, and they are a site where the Disney Corporation <coughs> brings their content to their stages to um, get their shows ready to go on the road. They contribute into the city of um, Schenectady right now over $20 million to the local economy. You, you're not going to get that from any other thing. You have to have it from people who are going to come in and spend their money, not only in the theater, but what they do when they, before they go and after they come out. You have 1,600 seats in your theater. You know what, Mike? You could have a parking lot there if you want one. That's not what you want. You have 1,600 seats. 65% of those seats will be occupied on any given night. That's 1,170 seats. Three times a week, two times a week, 1,170 people are going to walk out of those doors. That's going to, by inherently, just by having people on the streets at night with the life, with the um, traffic, that's going to help with what's going on in your city. And the next time you have us in here, after all of that opens up, you're going to be complaining to us that you have a gentrification problem. I hope you're right. I hope so. I've seen it happen, and I'm telling you, I'm going to be right. Yes. That sounds exciting. Thank you, yeah. Councillor Sullivan. Yeah. I'd just like to add that I, from a project like this, I see a lot of um, income coming into our community that can help pay for the things we need. So I think it's important to also keep our eyes on the prize with that. Like, um, if we need more funding for housing, if we are short with our policing, if we need more services, like, we will, you know, we're a pretty, um, we're, we're a pretty, empathetic communities so having more funds to do the things we need is really helpful so why not take um, the money from those who would like to come in and spend it um, I think I really if I could interject I mm -hmm. think these things if they <clears throat> are recognized wholly at, at each each side of this each dimension of it is actually recognized by the community which I think it is here mm -hmm. I really do think it is in Holyoke I would. I was so, always been so taken with the care in the city, uh, in, in the sense of because it is a city, and cities are often places that people came not willingly. Holyoke was a created city. Uh, it was an investment, and people. There were eight theaters here. Why were there theaters? Because. Uh, the Cabots were trying and the Skinners were trying. Because we had the most millionaires per capita in the world. <laughs> well, but they became millionaires because they had Paper people city. working here. That's Paper right. Yeah. There's only three cities in the world. It's uh, New York, Paris, and Holyoke. Everybody knows <laughs> that. I, I, but I think it's given us this urban, very urban view that a city can grow and be prosperous and also help those people who are not prosperous. Mm, and yeah. and that, is, that is the dialogue. And I think what Susan is talking about is you have to have you have to have that dialogue of assets mm -hmm. that and make sure that people um, that people who are uh, doing uh, what's the right word Maybe. cultural or entertainment events are also uh, that that is part in the financing and that they become advocates. Mm -hmm. I mean that's why New York works mm -hmm. and. And also, everybody needs to use ideas, ideas that they have about. I mean, I have to say, I, you know, I, I can never, I, you know, the murals are here in town. They're here because I didn't know you. We never talked, really. 
And you came up with that, I think it was you and some other people, came up with that idea about let's save the murals, you know, and get that happening. And we were able to get the money from the CPC. That CPA, that is, that's the kind of thinking that we have to engage in. And I think it's the kind of thinking that helps, it helps the issues that we have here, the, the poverty, the, the difficulties, uh, it, it, it's, a, it's really a dialogue with that. And, and ideas about how to do that, uh, I mean, I trained at Public Theater, the late Joseph Papp, and his concept was that the arts and social justice work hand in hand. And they are the people who created Hair, A Chorus Line, Hamilton, and without that work, <coughs> Actually, Broadway, the Broadway that we go to now, that was going to be torn down. Mm -hmm. There were certain forces in the city of New York in 1974. Uh, it was going to, they were going to be torn down. Certain Built forces. three theaters that are by the same architect at, at, that we have here. Mm -hmm. So it's, I, I don't know the answer to it. The skepticism is there, and there's, it's so embedded. But we can beat it. I know we can beat that skepticism. I just have one quick comment. Sure. Just one quick comment. I've known Don for several years. And I'm so happy, and I know the rest of you are as well, that your, your cup is always half full. <laughs> and that's really important. Oh. It really is. You don't get discouraged. And I think I that helps. And I have to say, people, I mean, you know, I have to def defend my own sanity, I guess people say. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I am a Massachusetts boy originally. My mother was from Springfield. I have a house in Belchertown. Yeah. Yeah. When I first came and talked to people in Holyoke. There was, I won't say who it was, they're still around. They said, you know what this should happen with city, we should put bulldozers up on 91 and push the whole thing into the river. I mean, that was the attitude. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. But, but though, you know, you can't have that attitude because where, where does that end? I mean, you could say that about every place in the world. Yeah. I mean, this is a place where people live and we can, and we have this asset. That's the way I look at it. The victory has given me something to be persistent about. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you all. I, I Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Motion, Motion that the orders be complied with. <laughs> Second. All in favor? All right. All right. Thank, Thank you so Thank you much. so much for addressing everything. And if you, um, I know I have a copy of this presentation, but if you didn't already send this to Jeffrey for circulation, please okay. do. Thank you. I think Thanks. we did, didn't we? Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Oh, oh yeah, what about this? Did Don't we need a motion to do something else? Motion to adjourn. All in favor? Aye. 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 <laughs> Aye. 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 A